the world on 3news.com. My name is Alfred Okansi. Now, this date presents an opportunity for us to talk about the issues of national concern from the key perspectives with our key guest in studio go straight to the point for and on behalf of the Ghanaian people. Another chorus of frustrations by another special prosecutor. Kisia Jabeng says that the consistent cases that he has lost in the judiciary or in the courts of law clearly points to an attempt to frustrate his efforts at the fight against corruption. He is asking if he has to resign at this point. He addressed the press during the week. Take a look. Let us bring before you the body of our investigation as evidence. Now, if you look at it and you decide that the evidence does not show up to the standard of proof required in criminal cases, then you can dismiss it. But don't prevent us from doing our work, from investigating. It is dangerous. As I said, I wasn't sounding as a prophet of doom, but there is doom looming ahead of us at very soon. A murderer will boldly walk to court to seek an, injun an injunction. Should I feel frustrated and resign? I took an oath when I was sworn in. And in my life, when I take on the reins to do something, I do it to the best of my ability. I often say to you, those who do not understand you, please forgive me. So that's a special prosecutor there transforming his frustrations and lamentations into a very popular account song that we know. That when his time is up, he will go because he's put up his life as a sacrifice, says that this fight against corruption is bound for doom if things continue this way. But are his lamentations and frustrations really grounded in fact? These are the issues we're going to be talking about this morning. Does he expect that every time he goes to court, he would have to win a case? Or... It is indeed the case that there are certain machinations in the judiciary to frustrate his efforts as special prosecutor in the fight against corruption. There is another school of thought that he, as special prosecutor, intentionally, otherwise, makes some very elementary procedural errors so that some people will get away with the crime. Is that really the case? We would table all sides of the conversation this morning here on Key Point. I have a number of lawyers joining us, plus a governance expert. This week, the National Communications Authority has been sued by Onya FM and Onya TV for its frustration of the work of these two media houses, which has generated a lot of concern about press freedom and then also the work of the National Media Commission itself in protecting the work of the media in this country. A number of people have also voiced their concern about this path that the NCA and the NMC, in fact, notifying the NCA took this week. The Ghana Independent Broker Association, GIBA, have voiced their concern and frustration about this particular position by the National Media Commission. There's a latest statement from the NMC that points to a number of things, including the confirmation of the fact that Onya TV and Onya FM have not been giving the forum to be heard as the natural laws of justice demand. 
the likes of the general secretary of the CPP, Anaya Jantua, means no words in speaking about this. Take a look. Not use regulatory institutions to do our work for us. If anybody is not happy with what uh, Captain Smart has said, mm. the person should go to NMC complain. There should be a complainant. When it comes to the work of the National Media Commission, there's always a complainant. You need to complain to them. Then they will take up the matter and investigate to mm -hmm. find out truly. Because even right now, where is the evidence? They should show us which of the videos. They should have brought it out, made uh, copies for us to know which of them that he insulted A, B, C, D. You don't just get up and write blanket letters. And you see, that is where the problem is. It's problematic because the president is the one who appoints the NMC chair, a body that is suppo uh, supposed to be independent. The president appoints the executive secretary. Maybe I slipped and I said the chair, but the president appoints the executive secretary. Okay. Because if the president appoints... Um, in consultation with the Council of State, yeah. an independent person who's supposed to be independent from any form of interference, and the person is appointed by the president, mm -hmm. who does he allegiance to? The president. Yeah. So it becomes immediately it is political. But you see, the way the whole letter is written, uh, um, Bella, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't sit well with this kind of gesture. It shows a form of interference, a subtle interference. You need to have a very objective ear when it comes to what they have written. So what is highest journalistic standards? It depends. So that's Nanaya Jantua there, plus a number of people who will be talking about this particular development today here on Key Point. The New Patriotic Party goes to the polls to elect their representatives in 111 constituencies today. Call it the orphan constituencies. These are the constituencies that the NPP does not hold or represent in parliament. There are 138 of them. That's 137 NDC held parliamentary seats plus the Fomena constituency, which is an independent candidate, so 138. 20 of these 138 seats are going to be popularly acclaimed. There are 111 of them that are up for grabs for the people who are contesting today. Plus, six constituencies that will not take part in the election today because the party has given the notice of some consultation ongoing, including the Fomena constituency. Here on your election command center, we are on the ground and we'll be bringing you all the detail every step of the way as voting starts. So these are the issues of key concern here on Key Point on TV3. We are live on 3FM 92.7. We will be back shortly after this quick break. We'll get into the conversation for the morning. We'll be back shortly. Welcome. We watch the Premier League on Super Sports, like we are in a stadium. Oh, that was not an offside. Last one was in an offside position, but he wasn't interfering with play. And Bruno scored. This Christmas year, entertainment galore on DSTV. The contents just go over you. Dial star seven five nine hash to reconnect or stay connected now. Get ready for a sizzling episode of Ghana's Most Photogenic. This 
This week, we dive into a sea of glamour as 12 stunning ladies bring the heat in our exclusive bikini photo shoot. Join us as we capture the essence of elegance and style. Who stays? Who leaves? Find out this week on Ghana's Most Photogenic. Ghana's Most Photogenic shows Saturdays at 8 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Pepsodent Charcoal and Lemon Infused Formula and Pepsodent Natural Herbal Formula. Game Park. Duffy's Health and Beauty. From one night stand to woman on top, she's got people laughing through and through with her jokes. I came here and I'm hearing Ghana Pigeon. I'm like, eh? You be right there now waiting up. Hey, Charlie, at the bed. Are, yeah. you, are you the bed? <laughs> when I travel outside, people actually like respect my profession so much. Like, like Nigeria? Yeah, like, like Nigeria, like the UK. Like you say you're a comedian, like, they are stunned. So you're not celebrated as much here? No, I am not. I'm telling you. Jacinta will be joining us on the day show this week, but she's not the only one. Hey, 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 hey. Those who are messing up are getting the verification. Those who are they messing up are getting the viewership. Yeah. So it makes the young one who is coming up who wants to join social media go like, if I don't go naked, I don't get the viewership. What does it take to be a Kobiche here in Ghana? These are my guests on the day show this week. Don't miss. It's going to be a blast. This Sunday, right here on TV3. The day show, Sundays at 3 p.m. on TV3. This program is sponsored by Onga. This December, experience the wonders of the Habbo City Bazaar, the most anticipated SME fair from the 7th to the 10th of December 2023 at the TDC Forecourt. Entrepreneurs, come showcase your business prowess at a cool 2000 Ghana cities. Food and drink vendors can secure a spot for only 1000 Ghana cities. And here's the spicy twist. Tema communities, assemble your cooking teams of three and compete for culinary glory. It's a feast of fun and commerce at the Habbo City Bazaar. To book a stand or to participate in the cooking contest, call 0532-200-927 or 0535-929-591. Save the date from 7th to the 10th of December 2023 at TDC Forecourt, where dreams meet opportunity. Doing FM 92.7 in collaboration with the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Prepare to embark on an epic journey. The stage is set, the lights are on, and the stakes have never been higher. Welcome to Mentor Season 12, the ultimate musical reality showdown, where 16 extraordinary talents will face off in a battle of passion, creativity, and showmanship. Is brought to you by Heaven Black Insecticide Spray and Mosquito Coil and Napa Foods, Sense Body Spray, Bell Ice, Vita Milk, Dragnet, Pepsodent Charcoal and Lemon Infused Formula and Pepsodent Natural Herbal Formula, Darling Lemon Drink, Frutelli Calipo. On Ethereum this Friday, Lord have mercy on me, Lord have mercy on you, Ebusia. I don't think I'll do a sack of camel panties. Come across here, send me there, mamma. My panties are doing a sack of candy. I see you saying, Lord, send me saying, Lord, also have Ronaldo on me. You're messing one of the As I'm on a make and make just yet. Who see me just here with them? Make quite a pint, it's a pint in the gram in Timus out. I show in Tiasia Nati and not the Pania Pam Namsa Hamano as the entity, Mina Pania Crank and Pamma as a good Samaritan. Bonia Maya and Nedia. Who pack of Pammy pants? 
Me call 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 me this holiday season, the Atlantic Mall near Medina Atomic Roundabout is your one-stop destination for incredible deals. Join us from Tuesday 19th to Friday 22nd of December for the Ultimate TV3 Pre-Christmas Sales Fair. From 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day, experience heavy discounts on a wide range of products that will make your home merry and bright. Whether you're looking for the perfect gifts, festive decorations, or must-have items, we've got it all at prices you won't believe the tv3 pre-christmas sales fair is on tuesday 19th to friday 22nd of december from 8 a.m to 7 p.m each day at the atlantic mall near medina atomic roundabout bring your family and friends to enjoy the holiday spirit with special appearances from santa claus and exciting festive entertainment don't miss out on the joy of giving and saving see you at the atlantic mall for the tv3 pre-christmas sales fair come shop save and make this holiday season Unforgettable. See you there. It's okay when someone says, "What? What do you bring to the table?" It's just up to you to understand what you're Sometimes worth. It's, it's the time, mm. where, when. <laughs> Imagine in an argument, then the man is like, "What do you bring to the table?" This is Queen Salom, winner of this year's Ghana's Most Beautiful. International football star Victor Osimhen made a comment wants a woman who is bringing something to the table. As a woman, you need to also give something to the relationship that makes the partnership very unique. You want to stand out, so don't be boring. Uh, the things that make you unique, make sure you bring them to the fore. No, but don't take no, no. it. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up! My God doesn't flop <laughs> because he doesn't wear what? Flip flop. <laughs> The Ladies Circle shows this Saturday at 6 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Yaz Sanitary Pad, Onga, Yumvita, MTN, Woodin, Cowbell, Our Milk, Gluta White. Going beyond, but beyond our mandate, but rather a case of hasty dismissiveness and lack of regard. Because if you take the four cases I tabled out over a period of time, from it all spans from July 2022 to Monday, this very Monday, there's a troubling trend. Okay, I wasn't sounding as a prophet of doom, but there is doom looming ahead of us that very soon. A murderer will boldly walk to court to seek an, injun an injunction. The OSP has commenced analysis of the risk of corruption in respect of the proposed partnership agreement between Tema Oil Refinery and Tema Energy and Processing Limited. The special prosecutor has directed the management of Tema Oil Refinery to immediately suspend the proposed partnership agreement, ongoing negotiations, operations, and all other ancillary activities arising out of and consequent upon the proposed partnership agreement until otherwise advised by the special prosecutor to enable us to uh, timelessly conclude the work. State lands, stool lands, and other vested lands. The OSP has commenced investigation into the appropriation, sale, and lease of state-owned lands and properties to individuals and corporate bodies since 1993. Well, that's a special prosecutor, Kisei Jabeng there. He addressed the press during the week. After the case of the La Bianca, the company owned by a member of the Council of State, and then also uh, when uh, Kenel Damois retired, was with the Customs Division of Ghana Revenue Authority until uh, he was relieved of his position by the president. That ruling uh, got the special prosecutor worried, frustrated. Eventually, he says that 
there is a grand plan to frustrate him, the judiciary. Is that really the case? Well, my guest in studio, Martin Pebble, is private legal practitioner. He's a convener of the Comparable Day Demonstration and the leader of one of three individual bond holder groups. I thank you very much, people, for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Kansi. Also, Professor Enoch Enchi is a governance expert, also a lecturer, and uh, the dean of the School of Business at the Academy City University. Thank you so much, Professor Enoch Enchi, for joining us. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Alfred, I'm thrilled to be here, and greetings from the Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Welcome back to Ghana. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> also, mm -hmm. Sevia Koji is private legal practitioner. He is uh, the head of public affairs of the Ghana Bar Association, the GBA. He is going to be joining us on Zoom. And uh, you would also be hearing from lawyer Justice Abdullahi. And then also we'll get a take from the office of the special prosecutor as we go on here on Key Point. But the special prosecutor, gentlemen, welcome again. Thank uh, you. And, and to our views as well. The special prosecutor did not mean words on telling us the lamentations and the frustrations that have left him, uh, as he says, a lonely bed that has sacrificed his life. And, well, when it is time for him to resign, he will go after he has done his bit and what he can do. Take a look. Wait. Let us bring before you the body of our investigation as evidence. And if you look at it and you decide that the evidence does not show up to the standard of proof required in criminal cases, then you can dismiss it. But don't prevent us from doing our work, from investigating. It is dangerous. As I said, I wasn't sounding as a prophet of doom, but there is doom looming ahead of us that very soon. A murderer will boldly walk to court to seek an, injun an injunction. Should I feel frustrated and resign? I took an oath when I was sworn in. And in my life, when I take on the reins to do something, I do it to the best of my ability. I often say to you, those who do not understand you, please forgive me. They say, I'm a young one, no man. But they make cry about for it. Me, yeah, they meet to me. I'm a swan, a cop. So that's a special prosecutor. For those who don't understand the, the key proverb that he quoted there, for century, you, so you want to do a quick translation of that? You know the understanding of what he was trying to put yes. across, you know? Yes, yes. I'm quite no man is a. Uh a bird that, that walks alone. And he's saying that he will do whatever he can. When he times reaches, then he will go. Uh, let me start this way, Alfred. Do you share in the frustrations of special prosecutor? I really share with his frustration. And Ghanaian should share in his frustration. Why? Because this, this is nauseating. This young man could have chosen to be quiet, look at all the corruption going on, and then get paid every month and leave but he's decided to fight corruption for the sake of Mother Ghana. And the very people we elected into power are frustrating him. And Ghanaians are quiet about this. Sometimes, you know, I don't understand the way we behave as a nation. Do we believe in the soul of a nation? And where are our values? Alfred, the poor never forgets. And anybody who's still from the poor will suffer for it because God also never forgets the poor. Let me put it emphatically, mm -hmm. and I want the media to record me on this. Anybody who takes from the poor will pay dearly with their lives and the lives of their children and children unborn because the poor never forgets, and when the poor never forget, God never forgets the poor. We are talking about a situation where we have a city tree institution, office of the special prosecutor. Look at what happened to Martin Amidu. Martin Amidu, to the extent that when he resigned, came back to say that his life is being threatened. Are we serious as a nation fighting corruption? That even institutions that we set up to fight corruption, we prevent them from doing their work. And this guy got choked 
on his throat when he was speaking. That I'm doing whatever I can. When my time comes, I'll leave. It means that we are using the same judicial blocks to prevent him from doing his work. I think that we should be worried about this. I, I saw the case of Domelovo. We all remember Domelovo. Domelovo, that's the, case, the name. Mm -hmm. The um, Auditor General. Mm -hmm. He was asked to proceed on leave in a bizarre circumstance. And he never came back again. Mm -hmm. So my question is that when we have got people to be institutions to help us fight corruption, and we use the same legal processes to frustrate those people so that they can have a leeway, then we need to sit down and see how our law works because it is not helping us. I told you in the north, when you go there and you say that you are going to court, you might, and you are a poor person, they might think that you are drunk because the courts were made for the rich. That was the perception there. But we have the legal aid, we have the shraj, we have other institutions that are supposed to help us fight corruption. When I saw a lot of things coming out, we know the CCD at the park case. Mm -hmm. And then we know about the Dubuahin case that they said is influence pending mm -hmm. a week before the elections of mm -hmm. the uh, presidential elections of mm -hmm. MPP. Mm -hmm. We saw that that influence pending, that since when did influence pending become not corruption? Mm -hmm. Since when? That Plus. Alfred, if I go and say that, okay, I know Alfred, give me 10,000 or 20,000, I can make Alfred get you a job. Mm -hmm. And then you give me the 10,000 and truly you get a job. That's influence peddling. Mm -hmm. Is that not corruption? It is, absolutely. So but, I don't know. What, what I don't that, know what how we interpret what, What's the position of the law? But you see, yes, mm -hmm. what you have said could be the case. Mm -hmm. But I want to be able, yeah. the argument in this case was that mm -hmm. there's no specific crime in the law books as we speak. <laughs> and we right? But the show was the precedent. Uh, uh, that that, that, that the specifically the show was criminalizes the influence that, that peddling. That's the OSP's view. view. Mr. Kisir Jabea, he's, exactly. he's in the minority. You mm -hmm. call plurality of okay. lawyers and they'll tell you session 252 is influence by the period. So okay. he even tells you that he himself, so you should recognize that. So he I'll come to you. I just wanted a quick right. intervention. That is just, so yes, I'm uh, saying that if, Professor, if that is not a, a corruption mm -hmm. issue, then let, let Ghanians tell. But he's raised some issues that, that mm -hmm. I, I am really interested in. Sale of uh, you know state lands. He talked about stool lands. He talked about other vested lands. We know what happened to Achimota, right? The only greenery in Accra that because most of the land here is all sold out. Mm -hmm. The only greenery where we have trees that will give us rain in Accra is being sold. People, what kind of country are we trying to build here? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the doom he talked about. Yes, if you look at the trend. It happened to Mart, you know, Martin Amidu. Mm -hmm. And when he left, he wrote a whole lot of articles. People are not even paying attention to him and reading it. But I've been following and reading about the frustrations that he went through. And Kisi is going through the same thing. Why do we waste our time, I'm using waste in quote, to establish these fine institutions mm -hmm. and then will not allow them to do their job to help the nation? He talked about payroll. Do you know that we have 100 million Ghana cities every year or every month from ghost names? Mm -hmm. And yet we've not been able to do that. And yet we're talking about digitization. Why don't we digitize the payroll system to make sure that ghosts will not come and sign every month to get paid? Mm -hmm. So th there are a lot of things that we have to do with ourselves because we have been bad to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And these are choices that will not help us because we are all thinking about the next elections, not the next generation. Mm -hmm. Look, people are ruling in this country as if they, they are ruling for their political party and then they are appointing authority. Mm -hmm. So you, are, you let them to positions. They are thinking about the person who appointed me to that position and then my political party. What happens to the nation, Ghana? And that is why I'm concerned. Coming from uh, just uh, Amsterdam, do you know that trains, how trains move? Mm -hmm. Can't we think about having train lines, rail lines, mm -hmm. connecting all the 16 regions in Ghana and look at the number of food that can come to the cities? Because our roads are not good. How many people even use air transport? From here to Takradi is 2,000 Ghana cities. From here to Kumasi is 2,000. The teacher that is earning 1,002 or 1,005, mm -hmm. how can that teacher fly? But mm -hmm. train is cheap. We can link all the 16 regions together. Food will come to the cities. Mm -hmm. Traffic will reduce. And that is how you build a nation. Mm -hmm. The foresight is not there. 
And if the foresight is not there, and we brought institutions for the institutions to help us so that we face corruption, because 25% of even aid that come to Africa, they say it goes to individual pockets. We are a nation that even during COVID, I was in the States, and Americans were thinking about, so what do Africans do? What do Africans do? We send the medication to Africa, and some people, individuals, were selling them. Mm -hmm. Then we send money to help because we're thinking about Africa. And guess what? We could not even account for that money in our own parliament. Mm -hmm. Money given to you, we mm -hmm. could not account for it in our own parliament. Mm -hmm. And yet you have political bulldogs who will sit down and say that, don't talk about us. Mm -hmm. Do not talk about us because it is our party that is in power. Look, and the media give these people the, the, the platform to insult others. So I was told that, Prof, you have your everything. Why are you in this, you know, you come and talk about it and people will lie about you behind you and everything. I told them that in leadership, sometimes you have to allow yourself to be ridiculed. Mm. And that is exactly what Jesus did. He allowed himself to be ridiculed, to be spit on, to, you know, people spank him and beating him so that you can have salvation. And mm. I am calling on all academia that this is the time for us to stand mm -hmm. and fight for this nation. The, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, the academia, we have plethora of intellectuals in our universities, but mm -hmm. they are not talking because mm -hmm. these political parties will release these young guys, mm -hmm. political bulldogs, mm -hmm. they will come and back at you. Don't talk about political party. Mm -hmm. But if Ghana does well, don't you all enjoy? Yeah, if the roads are good, whether it was done by NDC or MPP, we all enjoy it. Mm -hmm. If the hospitals are good, if the schools are good, we all enjoy it. Let's fight for the common good and stop thinking about only our political parties because Ghana is bleeding. Ghana is suffering. And that is the doom that Kisiya Jabin is talking about. Mm -hmm. But you see, the, would you also, um, all in all, uh, admit at one point, you made reference to this uh, Charles Edouard case that he himself, a special prosecutor, Another school of thought is that he's done himself in mm -hmm. a, a few times. Yes. He hasn't helped his mm -hmm. cause. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite queer mm -hmm. for him to, to come out publicly lamenting mm -hmm. like this and not acknowledging mm -hmm. that side of yeah. things as well, as mm -hmm. though all, all is well. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the courts. Mm -hmm. You only go there with a strong argument to win a case. You don't assume that every case you take there you must win. Mm -hmm. Prof. There's pressure on them. You know, there's so much pressure on them. And I've seen even individuals who have been in the Supreme Court, they have retired and they have come out to say that we should do A, B, C, mm -hmm. you know, to fight what is the wrong with the laws. Mm -hmm. But yet those individuals were in power and mm -hmm. they couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. I ask myself all the mm -hmm. time that how come that in Ghana, mm -hmm. people even in position that are supposed to make effect the change are mm -hmm. not able to do that? It means that there are some hands in the shadows. And these hands are trying to control individuals because the woman who just spoke, uh, you played a woman who just spoke, and mm -hmm. she talked about the NMC. Oh, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Yeah, so but if see. you look at government, you know, the president appointing a lot of people, you see this mm -hmm. issue, we should fix it in our constitution. Mm -hmm. Constitutions are like, like, are like procedures you know, at the workplace, policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. If they are not fixing the problem, why are they there? Mm -hmm. Then they are causing a problem. So we have a lot of institutions that the president appoints with advice from the Council of State. And we know that there has not been any individual in this country appointed and the Council mm -hmm. of State will say no. Mm -hmm. So the Council of State is just a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. You know, the first person I got to know closer to was Nanaya Aboji, a Kufuadro's uncle. Mm -hmm. He was the first Council of State member that Kufu appointed. Mm -hmm. And I was in the media, I was a morning show host mm -hmm. at Eastern FM in Koforidia. I went with him to the Tua Forest. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I asked him a lot of questions about the Council of State. He had a police escort, they had cars, and I said that. So mm -hmm. what do you guys do? Mm -hmm. And then he educated me at that time, that was in, in 2000, mm -hmm. about a lot of things that they do. But the Council of State has lived its usefulness. Mm -hmm. they have, what advice do they give to the president? Mm -hmm. And we have all these Council of State members, we are paying them, they have police escort and all that. Why come that a poor country that is borrowing all the time and we are doing this to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Alfred, before I end on this, I had a roundtable discussion last week, uh, and we talked about Ness of King, which is also another issue here in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And we realized that out of almost 34 million people in Ghana, based on the census we just conducted, mm -hmm. only 1.9 million people have social security. Mm -hmm. And I look at that and said that we are sitting on a time bomb. So when we say doom, 
It's coming from different angles. The mm -hmm. trend is coming from different angles. You have 34 million people, less than 2 million, just 5% mm -hmm. are contributing money to Senate so that they can earn something when they retire. That means that the current generation, generation, you know, the millennials, Gen Y, and the Generation Z are going to shove the responsibility, take care of their family, their parents, because mm -hmm. the parents have no plan mm -hmm. for the future. So all these institutions that we have, they are not helping us. And we know some of the issues that came up with SNIT. You know, mm -hmm. people, even when the lump sum money was given, people gave their money to the government, trying to buy some treasury bills, and then there was a haircut. So we have a plethora of issues where there is corruption well, well, you mean, everywhere. You mean the bonds. Corruption is bonds, permeating. Not, not, not treasury bills. Yes, yes the, the bonds. bonds. Yes. Corruption is permeating in every institution of our land. And when we have a fine office like the Office of the Special Prosecutor that is really trying hard, mm -hmm. you know, to fix some of the wrongs in our society so that the money which is going to individual pockets mm -hmm. can come to the state coffers so that we can use it to build roads, to build bridges, to build good hospitals. Now go to Kolebu and other places. Children are being born on the floor. Mm -hmm. People, we are in the 21st century. Go to other countries and see what they are doing. And we are here, people are taking money from the states. Some offices statutory established by the state are trying to fight that, and they are not even help, getting help from the people. So he comes to the public court, I think he's in order. But he is not Ankwanoma. We are all behind him. We are all into this together. We have to fight corruption because corruption has been the bane of Africa. Corruption has been the reason why we have not developed. Corruption is the reason why we are not respected at the world table when world leaders meet. Because our leaders always go to bed. When you have all the resources in your country, the plethora of resources in the bellies of our land, gold, diamond, manganese, and everything. Go to uh, Japan here and see what they have. Nothing on the land. Go to London here. What do they have? Wheat and sweet potatoes. But we have all resources, and yet we are poor. And it's coming from bad leadership. And the leaders we have in this country, we elect our leaders. Last week, Professor Lumumba was saying that he doesn't understand why the bad leaders are winning in Africa and the good ones are not winning. Well, we vote for them. We vote for our leaders. We can never import leaders into Africa. We will always elect one of our own to be our leaders. And if we are not picking the right ones in our society, then we will continue to suffer like this. But just fly six and a half you know, hours away from here to Europe and see what is going on there. They are even celebrating borders. Now people from Germany are going to the Netherlands and working and going back. Now look at Africa, what is happening. How many Ghanaians even work in Togo? Or how many Ivorians come to Ghana and work and then they go home every day? We, we have closed our borders. And even the little that we have, the resources we have, we are not able to manage it well. Mm -hmm. So the special prosecutor, I am calling, he has the right to lament. But the people of Ghana should support such individuals because they are fighting for our cause, not for themselves. It is not for him. He's a young guy. He's earning enough. He could have been quiet and then do everything. I am a young guy. I'm a young professor. What I am earning, I don't need politics to survive. But we do this. We talk about the ills in society because of the poor. Mm. For everything that I say all my life, I understand poverty. For the first 10 years of my life, I slept on the bare floor at Abu Abu number four. Hmm. seven months away from the world. I know poverty. So if God has elevated me to this level, I should think about the poor. And those who are thinking about their pockets, not thinking about the poor. Look at what our youth are doing on the streets. Unemployment. They have nothing to do. We cannot create jobs. And when somebody brings 24-hour economy, that we can work 24 hours. Students go to school from 7 a.m. They're closed by 5. You know, they're closed by 5. And once they're closed by 5, they that, can go that, to work. As Europe and America, people are doing. Students can have part-time jobs. Mechanics can work 24-7. Otherwise, can, we can have factories. Every individual can work. And then the more we create jobs, you know, and the more we fix the holes of corruption, I think that this country will move forward. Well, that's another conversation we can have on another day. But, Lea Matik, I bring you here at this point. Mm -hmm. Because for you, you have followed the work of the OSP. Mm -hmm. Right from the get go, I'm, I'm talking about yeah. when Kisi Jabin took mm. over as special prosecutor. Yeah. You haven't hidden your admiration for him, and that's just yeah. for for open disclosure yeah. um, on this matter. Mm -hmm. But then again, if you take a look at what has happened over time, mm -hmm. in fact, I recall that in the case of Cecilia Dapa, there was one 
error that he made, mm -hmm. which led to the court throwing out an application, mm -hmm. in fact, granting an application against him, mm -hmm. that you describe that error as very elementary. Mm -hmm. One procedural error that if you're asking mm -hmm. the judge to give you, mm -hmm. grant you that application to freeze the accounts mm -hmm. of the Pa, and you are failing to tell the judge the details of yeah. that account. Well, how do you expect the judge to give you that? Mm -hmm. That's that's you described as basic, elementary, mm -hmm. procedural, you know, error mm -hmm. that he shouldn't mm -hmm. have committed, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then we we, we we see it play out in and this uh, Charles Edouard case as mm -hmm. well, which you disagreed with him as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Granted that there are elements in the judiciary in there. Is it wholly the case that Kesija being has been treated? unfairly? That's the question that, or well, let's say, yeah, the answer has to be nuanced. So we have to give the various shades of it. Yes, if it, if, as soon as you say, has he been treated unfairly? I'll say yes when it comes to President Kufuado, because that one is easy and it's verifiable. Because when it comes to the office, as we sit here, Kufuado still hasn't given uh, Kisei Jabin the establishment budget. And when we talk about the establishment budget, even from the name establishment, that is the budget to establish the office properly. It's not been given. So he needs quite serious and uh, modern infrastructure to fight uh, corruption. That has not been given. The last um, half yearly report he gave. So it's a matter of uh, public uh, uh, this knowledge. It's in the report where he mentioned that, listen, they still haven't given him the establishment budget. And it was on the back of it that we gathered uh, 100 signatures. And just when we were about submitting, you know, there was this uh, 249 that they employed. So I thought, oh, that, then that meant that the establishment budget will come in no time. But it's been three months, it's not been done. And mm. so we'll go ahead and even submit it, right? Mm. Yes. So when you ask that, has he been treated fairly? As I said, we'll give a nuanced answer. When it comes to the executive, absolutely not, because mm. he's been starved, right? Mm. Yes. Now, then the next part, and I'm sure that's what you'll be mo most interested in. The judiciary, that one, no, it's, a, it's a very complex matter. Like you said, you've referred to the first, uh, well, not one of the cases uh, in talking about trying to get a freezing order from uh, the court uh, in respect of the accounts. And where I thought that, look, if I was a judge, there was no way I was going to grant that application because... The application didn't have enough meat. It didn't have enough details. That's in the Cicely Adapa case. Cicely Adapa's case, yes. So you see that that part, it's not easy for me to jump on the bandwagon and say um, the court has not been fair to him. We can't lump the cases together. We have to do one by one analysis. And then let me also mention this. You see, uh, Mr. Kansi, look, I make my living in the courts. Mm. That's why I can come and sit here and talk freely. You see, mm -hmm. yes, that's where I make my living. So uh, if I have to talk about the court, I have to be very objective because Monday morning I'll be in court. Uh, yes, that, that's mm -hmm. so five days a week. That is where I make a living. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the court, I have to be, you know, very objective. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, <laughs> very, very objective. And even sometimes even lean in favor of the court a bit because, Charlie, you can't... Without, you know, without also relegating the realities or the fact of the situation. Ex exactly. Not. That's why I said we'll take it uh, case by case basis. So mm -hmm. you see the Cicely Adapa matter. Let's even, let's even go back a bit and say, so the Cicely Adapa matter we spoke about, there were two applications conjoined in one. There was a seizure of the extra, let me call it, the second tranche of money that Mr. Ijabin found. That's the $590,000 mm -hmm. and then the 2.8 million CDs. That's, so he went to get uh, confirmation order for that. And mm -hmm. the judge said, no, it was beyond the seven days. So you see that one, I was clear that, oh, no, that one I disagreed with the judge because I thought that that seven days, the judge could have still uh, granted the order because it's not every timeline in the law that we keep. Yes, well, you ask lawyers, they'll tell you, it's not every timeline. There are a number of things, not to go into details, but there are a number of procedural matters in court that we don't, uh, even though there are timelines, we don't strictly keep because it's impossible, it's humanly impossible. So there are some that our jurisprudence have shown that, well, this particular timeline, when you don't go by it, we can, you know, it, it, an exception has been made because you hear to every rule there's an exception. So simply, let me just mention to, to put mm -hmm. it in context. When you go to court and you file your appearance, 
when it comes to filing your defense, most of the court levels is two weeks. Like in the circuit court, high court, you have to file your defense within two weeks, 14 days. If you don't file within and you go beyond, sometimes even months, several months down the line, once the other party hasn't taken a step of obtaining judgment against you, any time that you send it before that time, it's accepted. When it comes to judgments that the courts also deliver, yes, there are rules for eight weeks and all that. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court is held that if the judge doesn't bring the judgment within that time, and that's if the judgment is given later than the stipulated time, it doesn't make the judgment void. You hear uh, ex party, uh, uh, this is EPP, expandable uh, polytrain, blah, blah. It's a yes. long name. Okay. Those are just two examples. The other example. So, based upon it, I was thinking that if I was the judge, the seven days that Kisie Jabin didn't uh, adhere to, I would have covered it and said, look, the seizure and, and confirmed the seizure of the $590,000 and the 2.8 million, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that in that decision, one of it I was with the judge, the other one I was not, yeah. right? So we we'll do case by case, right? Uh -huh. So the point is to say that I cannot just blindly say that the judiciary has been unfair. We have to do case by case. Now, the other cases, you see, this is a press conference. In order for me to be able to follow, you have to put out so much details for the analysis on each one. So you see this, Madam Dapa one, we got as many facts as possible. So we see that we are able to analyze. The other ones, they are short, 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 short statements. Hey, I can't, I can't just uh, go with Mr. Jabin on it, especially as we've shown that he himself, the one we showed that, uh, the this confirmation of the freezing of the accounts, I disagreed with it because he didn't do it the way I thought it should have been done. So the point I'm making is that these other cases is mentioned because it's not put up uh, enough facts. It's not easy for me to go with him because for me to go with him, I must also assess, knowing very well that Mr. Jabin is a human being. He won't get it. He will not always get it right, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Jabin is a human being. So in order for me to go with him, I had to get as much details as possible about those other cases. And in this particular case, the press, they didn't have enough details. So I can't just run with The press it. conference didn't give enough details. Yes, for me to go with him on the other ones. So on that score, I have to uh, listen, uh, reserve judgment. Except to say that you know that I support his office. And of course, the other things he said, that generally, and Professor Entry has mentioned it, we are not supporting him enough. Not enough lawyers are supporting It appears... We are rather yes. uh, happy to support President Kufuado, who has been shown to be very corrupt. Mm -hmm. You see, well, and so he's starving me, say, a Jabin. Kufuado is making all the money. And Kennedy Japan, thank, thank you, Kennedy Japan. God bless you for exposing Kufuado and the rest of the government. You've no, said you it clearly. He's starving that, oh, yeah, that's why he's doing ah, But not giving the establishment budget, what do you think? Because the establishment budget, if he had it, he said Jabin would be able to watch. I mean, you know, the cyber, the, you know, a lot of modern gadgets that Forensic. he wants. Forensic. Forensic, so that he can, you know, fight harder. Ah, why would uh, Kufado uh, arm his opponent? He said Jabin is an anti-corruption, uh, this, uh, this, uh, his uh, agency is an anti-corruption institution. So if he uh, finances or, uh, what do you call it, equips it very well, it means that the fight on corruption is going to be increase several notches higher. And Ekufado will be hot. Don't forget the Manasseh, uh, this, uh, the fumigation he did, which he personally authorized and which will hold him accountable for. All those matters are still there. Yeah, he'll be answering for them. I can't wait for January 2025. Yeah, Ekufado will be answering for those corruption things. The ones that he personally supervised. We lost over 500 million when Ekufado himself personally said they should do fumigation when they were ready contracts and the rest. That's the uh, story Manasseh did and won the last... Uh, award, the West Africa Journalist Association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see that the international community looked at it and they thought that Kuf President Kufado was you know, corrupt what, what, in that what, what, instance. When this matter so, came up, the, the special prosecutor himself, in fact, you recall that mm -hmm. when Martin Armido was in office, mm -hmm. right, he raised concerns mm -hmm. about the similar cases of being staffed of resources mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. And then you hear this, this same special prosecutor come out as well. In this instance, his frustration is not with wholly with the executive. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the judiciary. Yes. So like yes. So Mr. Kansi, that's why I've said. So we have to do case by case. And unfortunately, not enough details were given for me to do case by case. But of course, I'll repeat that overall. And let's not forget, if all these cases is mentioned, if he had won, I would have celebrated. Of course, because we all want to fight corruption. And because we know that the way Kufuado is corrupt, his government is so corrupt, and in Japan he said that they have what? 
they are stealing their money and stashing it abroad <laughs> like, like there's no tomorrow. So I want to see more cases. But once those cases didn't go well for him, then it means that we have to analyze critically. And I said to analyze critically, I've not been equipped with enough facts on that. You see, mm -hmm. because we have to be, uh, you know, and they even tell you there's the other side to it. Another side to it is that for every practitioner, all right, mm -hmm. Mr. Council, let me mention this. As practitioners at the bar, there's one dominant um, uh, thought. Yes, like the way we practice at the bar. One very dominant mm -hmm. thought, and it's very key. So let's let viewers and uh, listeners pay attention to it. The fact is that when you go to one court, that's the uh, trial court, and you lose, usually we are not given to complaining too much until we've gone on appeal. So if the matter started in the high court, go to the court of appeal. If you lose there, go to the Supreme Court. You say, yes. And then even within the Supreme Court, after the ordinary bench is given the decision, there's also what we call the review jurisdiction. So you apply for a review. Uh -huh. Have you seen how Chachi Chikata fights his cases? Mm -hmm. Step, step, step. So the other side of it is that before I can talk authoritatively, apart from the fact that I don't have enough facts, the, those other cases, what has happened? Because let's mention Sir John. Mm -hmm. Sir John soon, after the decision, I thought there is an appeal pending. So as Mr. Jabin was complaining, what has he told us about the appeal in the Sir John matter? Mm -hmm. What has he told us about the appeal? And then the rest of the other cases, what has he done? So look, and that's what I'm telling you, if you ask majority of lawyers, this is what they will tell you, that have you exhausted the, the, this, the judicial uh, the avenues, the fora? Until you exhaust it, we can't throw our arms in the air. Prof, that's it. For us as practitioners, mm -hmm. that's it. You go to high court, you lose. Everybody will tell the master, go, 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 go. Go to court of appeal. Mm -hmm. Court of appeal, you lose. They say, no, 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 no. Go to the last point. Go to Supreme Court. After Supreme but Court, that's the frustration that's... he's talking about, that they are frustrating. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, that is due does process. Does this amount to frustration or it is due process that is... Because, due... eh? That, so that's... that's what I'm saying. I'm not in a position to go with Mr. Jabin because he's not, as I said, two reasons. One, he's not giving enough facts. And then two, he has not exhausted the appeal process. He should not forget that he himself, you see today, he's pointing fingers at the judiciary. A few weeks ago and today, we are still also pointing fingers at him when he let Edubwahim go. Mm -hmm. He let Edubwahim off, in, despite a clear of law, hook. off okay. the hook. Yes. He let Edubwahim off the hook. So Mr. Jabin, you see how it is? Today, you are pointing hands at the judiciary. They are frustrating you. You go to Dubuahin. This is an open and shut case. Open and shut. You heard Professor Entry, who is also supporting you here, and I'm your ardent supporter, supporting you to a fault. Yet you let Dubuahin off. You think we'll forget that one. So that's how it plays out. You are pointing fingers at the judiciary. You have let a Dubuahin off. Even people who are not lawyers all saw that, look, this is a Dubuahin matter. It's classical corruption. That is what we call textbook, a textbook example of corruption. Mr. Jabi, you are telling us Ghanaians that for you, you didn't see influence peddling. Meanwhile, influence peddling is all there for you to see in session 252 of Act 29. How can we do that? So you see, because you also have your frailties, it's difficult to just run with you and so that I will just also lambast the court when I've not seen enough facts. So you have to come again. That side there, you have to come again. You see? Uh -huh. If Maybe, but of course, we have to give you some slack because mm -hmm. you are in there. Maybe there are a lot, and naturally, there are a lot of things that you see that we don't see. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But that is not on the four cases. Because, yes, I heard you, and you see, for Mr. Jabin to say that, hey, we are, there is danger looming, meaning that there is more corruption, more. You heard, yeah. Mr. Kansi, can you read that part? It tells you there are still more, and we also know it's not every case that we hear publicly. But privately, we've heard of other cases that have come to your office and the way things are done, the way there's pressure and all that, right? Yeah, so those ones will support you. But it's not everything we can support. Mm -hmm. I can't support you against the court when I don't have all the facts. The ones I have, I would come to a decision on them. But the ones you don't give enough facts or it's not possible for me to assess or within that space of time. Don't forget, as I said, I also make my living somewhere. We come to sit here, we sacrifice our private time to be able to help because we are all trying to build a democracy. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you want to help the advocacy, you have to also gather all the facts and put them out there in the public. Then, based upon it, we can also help. 
by reading and analyzing. Because now, if you say, oh, back people, you to go to the court and check. To go and check where they, uh, they said, what do you call it, say, John appeal is. It's a lot of work. Well, that's, that's the message from Sami Dakun. I'm yeah. sorry, you know, lawyer yeah. Sami Dakun, who uh -huh. works with the Office of Special Prosecutor. Uh -huh. He says, there, in the case of Sir John, there's already a ruling. The ruling ha half steps o the OSP took. Mm -hmm. Canal Damois case. So what, is there an appeal? The details. They that, went to that, told there is an appeal. So what are, it, what are you saying about it? You have to put out enough facts. Have you exhausted it? Yeah, please go ahead. Let you can well, read uh, well, Samir Akun is going to be joining us in a bit. Yes. But it, it says that in the so customs La Bianca case is out. How can that not be analyzed? Charles Bishu says it's been long out in, since June. Um, why the uh, need for extra uh, information when information is already in the Where public? is that? So, uh, look, let's ask simply. Uh, La Bianca. Yeah, La Bianca, we lauded uh, this. Is La Bianca one of the cases? I thought we are talking about the court case. We praise uh, Kise Jabin for mm -hmm. the La Bianca yeah. one, right? We mm -hmm. praise him. Now, when it comes to even the La Bianca, uh, the judgment, uh -huh, you see what I'm saying? The thing is that, you see, Samit Dakwe and he and I, we've spoken privately about some of this. Uh, you see, that is his full job. For us here, mm -hmm. this is part time. If we can't call it part time, I said, we are citizens helping. It's a voluntary work. Voluntary work. Yes. So the amount of time Sami Daku can spend going to gather all the information, I don't have that. I don't. Mm -hmm. I must make a living. So to make it easier, when you do, put out all the, when you say, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, 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 the Damwa matter, as, as I sit here, Mr. Kansi, have you seen the High Court judgment, the no, Damwa matter? I haven't. I've seen not seen it. it. So how can I analyze? And besides, as I said, the dominant thought at the bar. So maybe what we can say is that uh, mm -hmm. as a lawyer, it's good Sami Daku himself is coming. So he can talk. From where he sits, he makes his living from OSB, right? Mm -hmm. So the extent to which he wants to go will be different from mine. Mine, I have to be circumspect because I'm in there. I'm in there. I work in the court five days a week. Mm -hmm. So certain things I cannot get support. He is a bit free, so maybe he can talk beyond even evidence uh, listen before him. But I can't because I live in the court five days a week. So you must give me evidence. Mm -hmm. You must. So you see, so when he says the evidence is out there, where is the La Bianca judgment? I haven't seen it. So what am I going to say about the, uh, listen, sorry, when we say La Bianca, we mean this side, the Kennel Damwa matter, Damwa in Educhi who went to court. The judgment, we've not seen it. So how can I say anything about it? We can't comment just based on what the media have given us, not thoroughly. If there may be some, uh, if you want, what do you call it? Just a general comment, a cursory one. I'll say, yes, it broke my heart when they lost. Yes, if that's the one, but I don't think that's just, just emotional yes. sentiments that you want. I think you want a proper critical analysis. Indeed. As for Lucy, yeah, when, when they lost that case, it broke my heart because, you know, as we said now, um, when Mr. Jabin came out with the report and told GRA to come out with a policy to stem those advanced rulings, let's use the normal word, the discounts they were giving to their friends and family, family and friends business, GRA complied. The Commissioner General, Abi Shada, he did well. He complied and they came out with a policy. And my understanding is that that new policy is being implemented and so the loopholes as much as possible have been what? Uh, patched or have been sealed and so presumably we are making more money. Now that La Bianca matter also, when he did it, based upon it, at least we've saved what? A lot of money. Even that particular case, we saved a few millions. So Mr. Jabin, kudos, kudos. As for that one, we've supported and supported you. It's where you say we should join in saying the courts are intentionally throwing out the cases. It's that particular one that, hey, I can't, oh, no, no. If I were to do that, it would show that everything I've worked for, I've just thrown into the drain. I can't come to join that one. Because what you know, Mr. Jabin, I don't know. You have far more. So this is what we call information so, so, asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Asymmetry. So he has far more information than we have. So once there's that imbalance, what you have, I don't have. I can't go so with give you. It out. Uh -huh. yeah, so give, give it out, out everything, then we can analyze. But with this huge information asymmetry, I'll be committing suicide in just joining you. Then it's like, people, you don't even know what you're doing. Today you say this, tomorrow I do, you're all over the place. No, I have to be consistent. We comment based on facts, you see. Mm. So, but Mr. Jabe, as we also say, the appeals are important. Yes, it's good, it's lamented, okay? It's also good to vent. 
Because they say men, often we don't like crying. Yes. And so because we don't like crying, things happen. And then before I discover the man is dead and all those things. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Let him, uh, I mean, lament. He's vented his spleen. It's okay. It's cathartic. Yeah, when people talk like that, it get healing. Now he said it. I'm sure lawyers would have called him and told him that, oh, no, no. What is happening to the appeals? Because that's the first thing every legal practitioner, one who practices in the court, that's the first thing you say, oh, but master, these cases you've mentioned, are you on appeal? That's the first yes, question yes, any lawyer yes. practicing. Mm -hmm. Practicing, that's the first thing you ask. Have you appealed? Where is the appeal? So he should have given, show a true light on the appeals as well. That's mm -hmm. a, as for supporting, we'll continue to support him, but except that we also continue to criticize, especially the way he left a Dubai off the hook. And it's not yet late. Mr. Jabin, please go back to the Dubai hinting. You, you made a mistake. We'll tell you a thousand times. Section 252 is good enough to cover a Dubai. It says that where okay. a person, okay, gives consideration to another, that he should influence a third person. It's what? Influence peddling. Don't worry about the name. The main thing is that do you see a sequence of three persons in section 252? It's clear. It shows somebody who is giving money to another person in the middle. So A gives money to B for B to be able to talk to C to get some favors in the public office. And it happens. And, and he himself, very good. And he himself even concluded that that thing is influence peddling. I said that Mr. Jabin was saying that he doesn't see any law in the, uh, what do you call it, Act 29, the Criminal Offenses Act. And plurality of lawyers, we are telling you that it's 252. Even apart from 252, we've also shown 247, where he collected money, when they do why he took their money, on what basis, and all that. And even also there's a part that when they do why he brought in that money, $40,000, obviously he didn't declare. And I did a case, the Supreme Court held that when you come in with more than 10, oh, sorry, the Court of Appeal, just uh, uh, last month, uh, it was one of the validatory judgments of uh, Justice uh, Amagezi, mm -hmm. when she was retiring, the last judgment. They held that when you come in with money beyond the 10,000 threshold without disclosing, mm -hmm. it involves an administrative penalty mm -hmm. under the Customs Act 2015, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah, so GRE, that's why I keep calling that GRE has to step in. Minimum, GRE has to take, uh, or that's impose penalties on a Dubai when he brought in the $40,000 without disclosing. Mm -hmm. And then number two, for Mr. Jabin, look, let's go to court. You see, they said that he's saying he doesn't see the law. Today, Mr. Khan say, I'm largely sitting here because I took cases to court. Pebble number one versus attorney general number one. Pebble number two versus attorney general number two. Number three, number four, and so on and so forth. That's what brought me here. That is how come your predecessors brought me here. Because they saw that, ah, this young, especially the non bill mm -hmm. it became very uh, popular. And then people thought that, oh, the one who did it, let's interview him. I think maybe the first few interviews went well. And that's how I got the seat here. So the point I'm making to Mr. Jabin is that where there is so much debate on the matter, mm -hmm. you should have taken the matter to court. Test it. Test it. You can't get it all right. So this is a Dubai matter. It's not dead. I'm now researching. I've just bought some books. They just got delivered about three days ago on influence mm -hmm. peddling. More. I want to research more. So I will call upon the... That is a very good thing. Yeah, yeah. I've bought two books from... We don't have professionals from... in this country who are reading all the time to update their knowledge. Exactly. Right. Right. should begin that process. Yeah, I've bought two books. They just came from, the, from Canada and then the UK. Uh, we want okay. to do more research and take this case to court. So, Mr. Jabin, we'll be fighting you on that one. You better recall the report on Edu Bahi. Were well, you doing it for Baumia? Because well, it's well, curious. Well, well, let, let me well, ask that well, question. Well, well, why is well, it that the well, report well, was released a few but, days, but, but, a week to so the you, you answer that question, that's uh, <laughs> what's his name, ah. Samir Dakon. But lawyer Sevia Koji is joining us on Zoom as well. He is the head of public affairs of the Ghana Bar Association. Lawyer Sevia Koji, can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning, Alfred. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, this morning. The specific verdict of the special prosecutor is that the judiciary at least based on the streak of cases that um, have gone against him, there's a grand scheme in his view to frustrate his passion, the effort to fight corruption in this country. Now, why do you say that he should have exhausted the legal process before resorting to the court of public opinion when in his own conviction he has seen enough to get him to that conclusion that the judiciary is not helping his cause. Amir, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for uh, a good morning to your uh, viewers. 
Uh, good morning to Mr. Martin Pib. Mm. Alfred. Morning, senior. Morning. Good. Morning, Martin. Mm. Uh, Alfred, you know, let us not just make general statements. You see, we are beginning to treat the judiciary like the Ghana police service. They don't do anything good. We don't want to hear that. No, he is a lawyer of high standing. All we're saying is that he may have his frustrations, but I, just as Martin was telling you, we have procedures we follow in court. We have a hierarchy of courts. So if you commence a case at the court, uh, at the high court, for instance, and a decision is delivered against you, if you are not happy, you appeal. When you appeal to the court of appeal, and you are still not happy, you go to the Supreme Court to the extent that you may even invoke the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. If you get to that last end, then you can now say that, oh, the system has ganged up against me. Even that, me, Sevia Kuje, after I have tediously exhausted the legal process, I will not say that because that is the terminal end. So all we're saying is that he may be frustrated at the time of expression of the frustration is quite premature because he ought to have exhausted the legal process. Then he will now say that uh, he didn't get what he wanted. Can, can he tell us whether or not the, the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court uh, would have been in a position to re, uh, reverse the decision of the High Court? He cannot tell us that because he didn't go to those courts. So that's all he's saying. And you know, it's dangerous for somebody like him to be making this statement. This should be coming from lay people. Look, we are all supporting him. The Ghana Bar Association will be the last group of people to say that, to say that fighting corruption in this country is a bad thing. Who will never say that? Who will never say that? We are level-headed uh, as a uh, uh, professional. I see. But then there was that uh, the, the underlying concern in there, which should sort of tends to tie into the sentiments that people even expressed before uh, Kisi Jabin came in. The, the, the confidence in the court itself. The reason why the people s sort of align with him or try to give Kesia Jabin's lamentations or frustrations a certain modicum of consideration is because of the, the confidence in the courts in itself, which has been captured in a number of reports, the Afrobarometer survey around nine and so on about the, the dwindling confidence in the courts, the suspicion of the courts not giving out justice as is expected, the judiciary in the eyes of the people, at least it continuously losing that confidence. That, that in itself presents a, a situation, a problem, that when Kesia Jabin speaks this way, it only goes to the minds of people confirm what has been the suspicion all the while. Does that not concern you? Alfred, I will be the last person to say that the judiciary doesn't have problems because it's a human institution. But let us be fair to them. They are, there are laid down procedures for you to follow. Did you do that? If you had done that, every, I would have been uh, convinced that, look, you had an issue. But here is a case where maybe you moved the first two steps, you did not conclude the process, then you have jumped into a conclusion that they've ganged up against you. Alfred, look, let us be fair to them. They may have issues, but I think that we shouldn't jump into conclusion. I will urge everybody to have confidence in the judiciary because that is our last line of defense. So we cannot just say that because there's a perception out there that uh, there's corruption in the court system. So even if you commence a process uh, midway, you conclude that you are being ganged uh, against. Meanwhile, you have, the, you have the opportunity to continue up to the end. So you follow the process through to the end, and then you can be convinced, or you should be, you, you can uh, you can convince somebody that look, I've done all this as required by the processes and procedures, but still, I think that there's something wrong. Look, why is it that when the High Court gave a decision that Dr. Opuni's case must be started all over again. The AG didn't come to hold a press conference, but he went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal said they did not agree with the uh, High Court decision. This is the kind of thing some of us expect Mr. Jabin to be doing. We are all in support of what he's doing. A society which is uh, half corruption 
gradually gaining ground or gradually get, get, getting institutionalized. Nobody would like such a society because we are, we are not saints, but some of us try to do the right thing. We let people know what we stand for wherever we go. That is why some of us, you can't even approach us with certain things. And I keep telling people that the judges themselves have questions to answer. If you, you know you are not a person of integrity, never dream of becoming a judge. Never apply, never take up the appointment because you are acting in the stead of God as a judge. Because people couldn't solve problems. That is why they are in court for you to assist them to solve problems. So Mr. Jabin may have his frustrations, but our point is that he is just uh, playing the game that he ought not to have been playing at the time that uh, he's doing it. Because if he had exhausted the process, as I said, I think would have, his position would have been better appreciated. But you, you see these frustrations that he's put out as a game he's playing? Why is that? No, because he's creating a whole lot of... You see, many more people may put different interpretations on, on it. Is he ready to work? If he's ready to work, there are procedures to be followed. Follow them. And I made a point the last time that, look, public institutions such as this office may have powers. Be, but in exercising such powers, they must also be mindful of the procedural steps that they must follow. Mind you, if people are accused of committing certain offenses and you want to investigate and prosecute them, should need be, you must also follow procedure. The courts will never forgive you if you miss out on the procedures, because those people too have rights. So he's ready to work, we know, but he must do the right thing. We are all in support of the fight against corruption. I'm yet to know of somebody who say that if for him he likes corruption. Because even if you're a beneficiary, yeah, one day. Let me make this last point before he come in. I have made this point that maybe Martin Pebble will agree with me that our laws on corruption itself are facilitating the process. Why do you have a law that says that the, give, the giver and taker of a bribe, for instance, are equally guilty? We have a situation where no two persons who are in their right frame of mind will go and do a transaction that they know is unlawful and come back to public and say that, look, I went to give bribe to person A, so arrest me and go and arrest him. I don't think any person would do that. I think that our under our special circumstances, the laws are made for us, not we made the laws. So if we think that our circumstances are such that we, we need to change the law, I would suggest that we now make the law to say that it is the taker who is guilty so that even if I'm sending you money, you don't know whether it's from me or somebody has sent me, so that we can get somewhere. Because uh, I, I don't think that... You, because the situation we have now is that the takers are taking. They are not reporting or they are not causing the arrest of the givers. So let's change the trend. I see. But you admit um, in that earlier submission that it is indeed the case that regardless of the low confidence in the judiciary, we certainly have no option than to go to the court, which is the case. But then you also concede that there are problems. And so people's sentiments are not born out of a vacuum. The, the concerns that people have expressed about the judiciary, the deficiencies in the judiciary, is not in oblivion. They are talking about people's own experiences, personal experiences, or the experiences of people they know about the judiciary, which you say it's indeed the case that the judiciary has its own challenges. What is the GBA doing to also help show up the confidence in the judiciary so that, I mean, when Kisi Japi comes out like this, people would not wholly support him, but also take into consideration the specific instances that the judiciary has also not helped itself? Hey Alfred, I would say that, that some of the things we do as GBA is the interview I'm granting you now. You see, we must educate people to understand how the adjudication, adjudication process works so that they should know that if you start from stage one, you, may, you have an option to move to stage two if you are not satisfied up to the last end. The problem we have with this particular press conference by Mr. Jebing is that he had not told any of us that he had exhausted the process. So it will create the impression to everybody that, well, if you go to court of first instance and they deliver a judgment against you, that is the end. But that shouldn't be the case. That is the concern we have. 
That is why I'm saying that we should be fair to the judiciary because they have laid down procedures and steps to be followed. So let's be mindful of the steps, follow them uh, duly, and then we can complain. That is, that is our concern. So education of people as to how the adjudication process works is important so that we don't even have situations where people will hold clubs and go to a court that they're going to attack the court and the court staff because in the process of doing the case, the way cross-examination or evidence was being taken, they were not satisfied. That is not your issue. Wait okay. for the court to come to a verdict. Because no court delivers a verdict or a judgment or a decision in a vacuum. They look at the facts based on the evidence or take the evidence and apply the law and come to a conclusion. So if you don't wait up to that stage, how then do you come to a conclusion that uh, it hadn't gone in your favor? Well, lawyer Sevia Kuji, uh, stay with me, but thank you for this first point in, in, in the, that, that you made. Sami Dakon is uh, with the Office of Special Prosecutor. He is going to join us on Zoom briefly on this matter, and then we'll move to the next issue. But you see, Lawyer Mazik a number of the things that the Ghana Association talks about ties into the issues that you raise. Mm -hmm. But then again, it also doesn't take away, as I indicated, the concerns that the people have about the judiciary is in, in itself, about the, the, the confidence and so on. So you get people n normally mm -hmm. just un siding with the special prosecutor because of the existing concerns about the judiciary, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kansi, let's put the, the, uh, Briefly. this one Briefly. in context. It's not mm -hmm. only the judiciary. All the arms of government have the same problem. The Speaker of Parliament just referenced uh, the, uh, the, one of the newest uh, uh, surveys on this matter of trust. And that was the Sunday before last Sunday. He referenced, mm -hmm. I don't know which institution, but he mentioned that that survey said that judiciary got 8%. Parliament got 8%, right? Mm -hmm. And then, no, sorry, the judiciary got 10, Parliament got 8, and the presidency got what? 14. 14 percent. So you see how it's very, very low. You know, this is the same presidency that the last time, last year's transparency, uh, GII, uh, when they are, uh, listen, their survey came out, the presidency was seen to be the second most corrupt institution in Ghana. Second most corrupt. Yet in this survey, they even did better than the uh, parliament and the judiciary. The presidency got 14 percent. Okay, actually, yeah, the president, they said the president, 14 percent. So the point I'm making is that, listen, as for trust in the arms of government, it's all over. It's been low. And it's because of the general, uh, what do you call it, outings, the outcomes we are getting. So it's not only the judiciary. So if people, if citizens say no, they don't trust, it's difficult for me. We can do a bit to in, uh, what, educate. And also, Mr. So Kansi, this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. For us, we want to take it on a case-by-case yeah, case basis. Case-by-case. Case. Otherwise... Like I've said, so today, as I'm sitting here, I'm the same person. And let me remind you, so anytime you see me here, the reason I can't just say the judiciary are frustrating okay. me. I've done what? Table number one, number two, number three, number and four. All and those cases. Many are like, look at even Domlevo. Then they say Kufado acted rogue. The Domlevo mm -hmm. case, CDD, I did it. I took CDD and other uh, this, uh, nine CSOs to mm -hmm. court. Of course, people have said that the Supreme Court delayed. But eventually when it came, it was a big indictment against President Kufuado. We won. So today it shows that Kufuado was one person who sat Domlevo when he saw that Domlevo was about to expose corruption against him. The mm -hmm. cruel and associate Kufuado and, and uh, Osafu Mafu, the cruel and associate case and other cases. Uh -huh. You remember just at that, around that time too, the case of the 52.5 billion that we couldn't find. The Auditor General's report showed that we couldn't find 52.5 billion. And you know that three years on, Mr. Michael Flu is still chasing it, the former president of the Institute of Taxation. Yeah. He's still chasing it. The Auditor General's report is still not out. 52.5 billion. And, and which, which year was this? This was in 20, 2020. 2020. 2020. 2020. Yeah, 2020 yes, that was one of the report. reasons Domlevo was sacked. So fellow citizens, fellow Ghanaians, you see, you are seated. So the point I'm making is that Yet, when the matter went to court, the Supreme Court said Ekufuadu was dead wrong. And it's not that Ekufuadu didn't know. He was acting intentionally because the Mlevo had you, caught you, him. You think so? Yeah. Oh, it was you, obvious. It was obvious. It was very obvious. Look, international institutions had written to Ghana, the International uh, Association of Auditors. Everybody told Ekufuadu that, hey, 
this matter of asking Domlevo to go on this long leave is unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. Yet, Ekufado will not listen. Why? Because Domlevo was about, he had even caught him. It was clear that they had stolen. That's how it looks. That's how, because to date. But, 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 so, so, Samida, so we'll get back to this. Samida is, is joining us. Let's not lose him on the, on the, on Zoom. Samid, can you hear me? Samid Ako, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? I can hear you, if you If you can put your video on, we, we are having a little... No, you, can, you can see my face. You can only... Um, okay, that, 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 that's, 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 that's fine. Uh, but you see, we've had a number of positions espoused by, just as Martin Pebo, by the Ghana Bar Association as well, make the point that exhaust all the legal processes before resorting to the court of public opinion when, when you disagree with the rulings of the court and, and not just go on the press conference and say the judiciary is a grand scheme uh, to, to frustrate your efforts as special the office of special prosecutor to fight corruption. Yes, Alfred, thank you so much. First of all, one of the problems we have in this country is also how media portrays stories. It's a very big problem. Uh, if media does not appreciate a statement that is made by an office like the OSP, it becomes problematic how you also communicate to your audience, just like how you box it into OSP versus the judiciary. Yes, um, I think I have read about GBA. I'll come to that. As for GBA, um, they are unique and um, often their stance are quite interesting. So. Um, and their sons can never be surprising or out of the blue. Um, I will call them, um, how do I call it? I'll call them like a stone. They are always where they are. Um, I heard Martin Pibble also make some statement. I'll come back to you. Martin, we love Martin. He makes, uh, he, he's, he, he, he likes fighting, his goodwill and all that. But we also do acknowledge that in many instances, he makes um, sweeping statements at people, organizations, and so we will come there and address that matter as well. But let's go to the substance of OSP. And that's why I said I would need a little bit of time because you've had, um, and that's one of the reasons I don't really want to do interviews via um, phone because you may not have adequate time as people who may be on the panel in studio. Now, the OSP, people must understand it's not just a prosecutorial office. Often the misunderstanding is that the OSP is just a prosecutorial office. No. And we've had instances where um, we've even, um, and, and this is no. There was a program that was organized by Shraj where we had a number of court of appeal and high court judges where um, there was a mini clash between uh, myself and some of the uh, justices over these matters. And their concern was that, why does the OSP issue statement after a ruling has been delivered? Why does the OSP do that? And what if the OSP does that? It pitches the OSP against the judiciary or it creates an impression that something is going wrong. And the explanation has been very simple. The OSP is an organization that all of us are trying to appreciate. It's one, a law enforcement agency two, a prosecutorial office, three, asset recovery office, four, a prevention of corruption office. Now, if you want to know the duties of OSP and the prevention of corruption, you must avert your mind to Regulation 31 of the OSP law. It tells the OSP to do so many things. One, it tells the OSP to even bring out names of people the OSP considers not fit to be in public office because OSP has information that they may be corrupt. Except that it doesn't give the OSP power to stop the appointor from appointing such persons. And how can the OSP do that? The OSP can do that after it's done some investigations on such persons. It also empowers the OSP, for instance, to publish detected acts of corruption, which means that if the OSP um, is able to do its investigation okay. and notice that somebody might have engaged in corruption. You must give me a little time. Mm -hmm. I told you that. Give me a little time. I know you are in, in a hurry. In, 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 but indeed. I'm, but you are going to I'm the also, specific I'm, issue. I'm yes. moving to you a particular point that there's a lot of duty imposed on the OSP. 
prevent corruption. And there's a lot of duty imposed on the OSP to tell Ghanaians when things are not right and when things cause corruption to grow in the country. The press conference of the OSP, it's not about whether he, he should appeal, he cannot appeal, like the GBA man was suggesting. It's basic law. And who said that the OSP has not appealed uh, some of the cases? But we are talking about interlocutory decisions. That seeks to clock the OSP from doing its work. And I'll take the first case, as you said. Um, Martin Pepe said we have to take case by case. And the reason why I sent you that information was because that the ruling on Sir John is all over. Any lawyer worth his sword would have read the ruling by now and come to a conclusion whether you agree or disagree. So we have sent one matter to the Court of Appeal to decide. Assuming the governor of the Bank of Ghana discovers that he has a terminal illness and the doctors give him two weeks within which he's going to die. So by some corrupt means, the governor pushes all uh, the monies in our consolidated fund to his private account. And the two weeks doesn't even reach and the governor dies. Will the court tell Ghanaians that, oh, the governor died before OSP discovered that um, he might have engaged in corruption and so we should allow his estate, his family, to spend the money. Or the court will fashion out a way for Ghana to get back its consolidated fund. The point SP is making is that these interlocutory decisions that seeks to stop the OSP from either investigating somebody or either clothing somebody with immunity hampers the fight against corruption and emboldens people. It does not mean that the OSP cannot appeal or the OSP will not appeal. The OSP is duty bound to let the public, including the judiciary, including all the arms of government, know the things because it says that we must take steps and show Ghanaians which the processes, procedures, manuals, culture, everything that hampers corruption. And so okay. a, press, a presser by the OSP, it's not because he thinks that he cannot appeal. No, he's already talking and demonstrating to us the danger and the harm and the precedent you set and how it will prevent the body from doing an adequate job and emboldening people who, are, who engage in corruption to seek uh, refuge under the law. But what is the second case that uh, Martin said, Charles Bissu? It's a very simple case. We all know that the law says that the law enforcement agency cannot detain you for more than 48 hours. And thanks to Martin Pebble, the 48 hour rule has been largely been working. So what it means is that if you are arrested, you are federal counsel, you are suspected to have committed corruption, you are arrested. You have 48 hours within which to get bail. Why does uh, a suspect run to court and say, stop OSP from arresting me? And the court also, expert, without seeing anything from us, goes ahead and stop the OSP. The SP is pointing out to Ghanaians, if we are not careful, and a lot of um, corrupt persons get to know that this has been, in fact, as we speak now, Cecilia Dapa has also filed a human rights action in court, asking the court mm -hmm. to stop the OSP from investigating him, and a perpetual injunction to stop the OSP from getting into the matter. It's just like the same action that uh, Charles Bissou took. Charles Bissou thought about five different actions, all seeking to stop the OSP from investigating him and prosecuting him. And for almost six months, it is his right to do that. But OSP is trying to also say that if we are not careful and we allow this culture to fester, it's going to impede the fight against corruption. Maybe I can allow you to ask her because the other ones. But if the, I there's a specific the case in, the, in this specific case of um, Charles Edboy. The reference that Lawyer Matipebo makes about your conclusion that whatever happened in this case, even though uh, the, it amounts to influence peddling, there's no specific law that criminalizes that or, or describes that as corruption. He makes reference to Alfred, Section 252. It's, I'm a, coming. it's a dead horse. It's he makes, dead horse. He makes reference to Section 252. I'm, I'm coming. Yeah, Something let me help hold you. on a bit. He makes, a, he makes reference to Section 252. I know what you're going and, to and, say. And, and makes the point that you cannot make that conclusion without taking into consideration the provisions of this section and, and make it look as though nothing really wrong happened. And so you left him off the hook. That's the point about uh, Charles Edubuain. Yeah, Charles Edubuain, let me tell you, it's a dead horse. You see, when he was talking, he even made reference that we can even use section 247 of act 29 
but the OSP has no power over Act 20, uh, Section 247 of Act 29. The OSP rather has power over 151, Section 151 of Act 29. So we'll tell Martin people, this is a very simple research. He can check it up, right? On the issue, look, the job of a prosecutor is not always to win cases. That's why uh, I find the GBA stands very funny. It's funny because, of course, their job to always come and say we are protecting the judiciary. But Chrissy Ejabin, as he said, is not here to pitch the judiciary against um, the, the public. He's saying that even if it were academic exercises, he had the right to talk about the rulings. But this time, he carries a bigger burden. He's not a private legal practitioner. He is the special prosecutor of Ghana. Even when the Attorney General had issues with the Oponi case, he took steps to do other things and made people know his stance, that it was a wrong decision by the judge. In the end, things have, have happened. What Kisia Jabin is saying is that, as a prosecutor, it is not about how many cases he has won. He can win even 100 cases. If after the 100 cases, corruption is still rife, he has failed. And it is his job to determine whether there is sufficient evidence to prosecute someone, or whether his law allows him to prosecute someone. So let's take Mahama Yariga, for instance. Mm -hmm. He had been placed before court by the former special prosecutor for um, tax evasion, among other things. When Tisei Jabin took over and studied the file, he noticed that the OSP did not have sufficient evidence to prosecute him. He stopped the prosecution by filing a nolly prosecutor, and it didn't go on. It does not mean that the other people, especially those who belong to um, the, the ruling party, were very angry because for them, even if you think there's no sufficient evidence, keep the man as long as you can in court. Let him be going up and down, and he will learn lessons from it. But that is not the job of a prosecutor. In the same vein, like Martin Pibble and others, they think that, oh, you go and try 252 and put him there. At least going back, court him back and forth, you would have wasted his time and all that. Let me ask you, Alfred, if we did that to you, will you be happy? If the OSP did that to you, will you be happy? Police service, we have all been defense lawyers before, and police administration. I, I remember there's a particular case as a defense lawyer I was following, and I kept pointing to the police that the evidence does not support the charge and nothing okay. going on. But they said no. L let me finish. It took six years of very poor boys, about six of them, to be in court till the court set them free. Six good years. What, what is the point that you are punishing them? We have said that. Martin Pepu does not have the raw tape. Martin Pepu does not know the case as much as we know. He has not even seen the raw tape. He doesn't have access to the interview we had with Tiger IPI, the interview we had with all the persons involved. Tell me, where in the video did Charles Dubuahin say that he is collecting money to go and influence President Kufuado? He's collecting money to go and influence Vice President. He say, oh, you, know, you can influence from it. Where? If a person says that, I want to have a discussion with the presidency, and what, 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 what can I do? And he says, that, oh, um, if you want to see them, I, I know the president okay. is my, uh, right. is my uh, uncle. I know this person is this. So uh, you can go and see them. Uh -uh. Does, that mean that, does that mean that the person has said that he's going to influence okay. them? But you it's not everything that looks like a crime. That but, is but, a crime. But, 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 own conclusion. Yes. yes. Listen, Jabin, your own boss, I mean, that, listen, your own boss signed and said it is influence peddling, but that you cannot find law. That is what your report said. So what are you now saying? You are disagreeing with uh, Kisie Jabin. Uh -huh, you see, <laughs> Sammy, that, you see, you are not disagreeing with your boss. Please read the report. It says it clearly that this is influence peddling, but that there is no law. That is what your report said. Now you see, you want to just mix up the evidence. You see, the, the, so, that's so, how so come. Uh, I've, I've seen this kind of blame okay. shifting yes. and trying to attack. But Africa, quickly, uh, in this minute. is what is done in U.S. They scrutinize judgment step by step mm -hmm. right. and then case by case. So what I would say here is that when you see the special prosecutor coming out after every judgment to the mm -hmm. public to state their opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. 
in law that is allowed mm -hmm. that come out and say that this decision we don't agree and then he talks about the, the, the doom ahead that that's fine but then he should go beyond that mm -hmm. to also to the appeal court mm -hmm. to appeal so that we can also exhaust all the you know the steps in the law mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong also exhausting every step and then criticizing or really scrutinizing the judgment. I think that that is yeah. fair. Yeah, Mr. Kansi, okay. one last statement. Yeah. The, and then he mentioned 247. If OSP won't deal with 247, what do we do? The law says it should what? Collaborate with other institutions. Mm -hmm. This is the other part matter. Didn't OSP say he's going to call in those who have the mandate over money laundering? That is yes, say, even FBI. Uh -huh, FBI and yes. then what? Yoko. Mm -hmm. In Cecilia Dapas case, didn't he say they have been saying he's bringing in other institutions? So they do buy him matter. What happened that you're saying that because you don't have jurisdiction over 247, then it's closed? Oh, please be consistent. Just be consistent. Listen. Right. You make a mistake because this matter okay. won't die. Right. It won't die. And you see, the more you make us drag it, the more you lose. And the point we're making is that, especially where there is this contention debate of, of, uh, about whether it is 252 or it is not, I've told you that you test it in court. I am chief tester. And today you see how mm -hmm. our jurisprudence has been moved forward because of things that are tested. If you check, relatively at the bar, I'm a young man. Okay. I met senior right. lawyers who said, ah, people, this thing, have you read well? Have you understood this? And what are you doing? These cases right. you lose. Today, what have we seen? Our democracy is moved forward. The cases are won. Okay. Lawyer Martin Pebble, thank you very much for joining us um, uh, on this matter. In fact, we're going to move to the next. Uh, lawyer Xavier Kuje. Thank you for, for joining us uh, on this matter. Really appreciate your time. Sylvia Koje is the Director of uh, Public Affairs of the Ghana Bar Association. Also, uh, uh, Sami Dakon, who is uh, a Director of Strategy Research and Communications Division of the Office of Special Prosecutor, also joining us briefly on this matter. We'll go for a quick break. When we are back, we will go into the National Media Commission and the Onia FM Onia TV case. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Life can get hectic. And sometimes we forget to prioritize our well-being. That's where Vernal Mineral Water steps in. A refreshing solution packed with essential minerals, Vernal Mineral Water keeps you hydrated and balanced. Whether you are at home or work, Vernal Mineral Water is there to keep you going. Don't let a busy shuttle hinder your health. Make Venom Mineral Water a part of your daily routine. Share the love with Venom Mineral Water, the choice for a healthy, vibrant you. This advert is FDA approved. The news never stops. If it's not breaking, developing, the news lends itself to significant analysis, broad context through explainers and the features that give stories more life. That's what we offer on Weekend Central. News, features, analysis, the full package. Weekend Central, Saturdays and Sundays at 12 p.m. on TV3. TV3, first in news. On Ethereum this Friday. Lord have mercy on me. Lord have mercy on you, Ebusunya. I didn't see now doing sarko kame panties. Kona kosi ese me dey mamia. Me panties how do you say what can the assistant say? Lord, Sally say um. Lord, also have Ronaldo on me. Ye me sing kwa ne bundi. Ase mo ane me kanu me nti asye. Kosi me nti asye u demo. Me kwa i panti sa panti ne kula me nti mu zau tai show. Nti asye na te. Ena di pania pam nem sa hamano. Ase ya titi. Me nti pania kula ngam pama. Ase gu sa maritime. Bonya ma ya ne ne di. Who kwa kupa me pants? you gotta be careful with me. Do you get what I'm saying? It's okay, it's okay. Method, malaria game changer, no, no. Top code, Udium Pepe. Ethiera, this and every Friday at 8.30 p.m. on TV3.
Discover the Arabian charm and the Emirates this end of year aboard the magnificent MSC Virtusa cruise ship. We invite you, your family and friends to join us on a journey of discovery to Qatar, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Dubai and Sabanias Island from the 22nd of December to the 1st of January 2024. This all-inclusive package includes a seven-night cruise with breakfast, lunch and dinner, entertainment on board board, two-night post-cruise hotel accommodation in Dubai, all grounds, transfers and travel insurance, all visas and return flights. Call us now on 0308-251-055 to book this amazing offer starting from $3,990 per person sharing an inside cabin. Life is better at sea. Experience it. Brown's kitchen, Mac Brown's kitchen. I read you say me do Mac Brown's kitchen. Brown. New season, new stations. Hey, Mara. Hey, Mac Brown's kitchen, yo. Na me who want TV swatch? Ani yo, me who yach? But the enemy a yeni. En chakra ano? Eh, but TV three. Me me debia. Five to six p.m. Nana ya ba shamu wati. Mini mi kunene me ma ya ba shamu se sako se sako. Ghana fwado. Hey, that's it. McBrown's Kitchen shows this and every Saturday at five p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Ba Herbal Akuma Onion Paste. Get trash. Everyone, get ready for the most thrilling and captivating dating experience in Ghana. Are you single, ready to mingle, and looking for true love? Date Rush, the time is now. I'm sure you have your answer. Of course, yes. You are expected to come dancing again, put off the rush of one, and take your date away. Okay. Turn up the heat and find love like never before. Come screen for a chance to be a part of this season of Date Rush on 25th and 26th November in a club at the TV3 premises and 2nd December at Akuma FM at 9 a.m. Are you interested in being a part? Send your picture and details to WhatsApp number 050-417-2847. Don't miss out on this chance to find love. Date Rush. Everyone deserves love. Welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. We're live on 3FM 92.7. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And also on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. I acknowledge the messages that a number of you have sent uh, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo um, also sends a message in um, making reference to a, a, a Socrates prediction. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo, good morning. Thank you um, uh, for the message. This one here from Isahaku Tamale says that I am happy uh, lawyer Xavier Kuje has mentioned that the OSP may be playing games with this press conference because I also think that He's intentionally doing this as a way of getting the people under his investigations to also be a diversionary tactic, you say. Um, there's one here from uh, Papa Bisu from Accra. Uh, thank you very much for your message. You says that even though the OSP needs all the support, um, is that not a disgrace on the government that it is coming at a point where Almost all these cases that he's investigating, he is facing all these roadblocks, you say. Musa from Ab Musa Abatwa in Aswasi, thank you very much for the message as well. You talk about, let's be fair to the fact, nobody who's prepared to fight corruption will have free hands to do so. There's no single institution which is not involved in one corruption or the other, you say. Thank you very much, and uh, so many of them. Now, let's go on to our next issue for the morning. 
Now, this week, Onia FM and Onia TV uh, sought an injunction at the Accra High Court over an intention by the National Media Commission as communicated in a statement. Just for the uninitiated, let's give a, a brief background to this. Take a look. First of all, here is how the case played out. On Tuesday, November 14, 2023, Media General received a letter from the National Media Commission which was wrongly directed. The letter complained of a broadcast simultaneously carried by ONFM and ONIA TV. Now, in the same letter, the NMC imposed sanctions on the two stations without asking for their side of the story. In response to the letter, the company drew the attention of the executive secretary of the NMC, George Sapon, to the error and also stated that the station should be given an opportunity to be heard as is required by the procedures of the National Media Commission's own Complaint Settlement Committee. But George Sapon refused to give the, or has refused to give the stations the opportunity to be heard and also uh, giving, has also not named any complainant in the case. Meanwhile, he has threatened to have the frequency authorizations of the two stations suspended, among other illegal actions. Media General finds the actions and posture of the Executive Secretary arbitrary, unconstitutional, and against the principles of natural justice, and therefore filed a case in court to stop the Commission from further harassing the two stations. In fact, the company states in the suit that the, the Media General, and then uh, that's the Media Commission, by its actions, has constituted in itself into a complainant a prosecutor and a judge in a complaint and from its actions cannot be trusted to be a fair and impartial arbiter in any case against the two stations, Onya FM and Onya TV. Um, the NMC Executive Secretary, without any complaints or investigation, invitation to Onya TV and Onya FM, decided to be the complainant and the prosecutor and the judge and pass the judgment. We will go into the uh, the constitutional provisions in Article 167 of the 1992 Constitution that specifically details uh, the work of the of the NMC and the functions of the National Media Commission. It states one to promote and ensure the freedom and independence of the media for mass communication or information, and then B. And this is where the emphasis is to take all appropriate measures to ensure the establishment and maintenance of the highest journalistic standards in the mass media, including the investigation, mediation, and settlement of complaints made against or by the press or the mass media, to insulate the state-owned media from government or governmental influence and control over the professional functions of a person engaged in the production of newspapers or other means of mass communication and to perform such other functions as may be prescribed by law. Our emphasis is on the B of Article 167. Now, Lyamatic people, known, knowing the details of this case and all the statements that have been issued by the NMC on, on this matter, does the opportunity to be giving a hearing, is it a red herring or it is an important aspect of the NMC's whole process of investigating even before passing the judgment on the conduct of a particular media house? Hmm. As I can say, it is the beginning and the end of the investigations. If you haven't heard the other side, then you haven't even done anything at all. It is front and center front and center of every investigation. You have to hear the other side. So, and look, to further, even apart from Article um, 167, that talks about investigating, there's also the LI 1587. So that's the law that, uh, that's a uh, settlement 
procedure. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it. Uh, LI 1587. That's what the National Media Commission is to use. So it's called National Media Commission into brackets, Complaint Settlement Procedure Regulations 1994, LI 1587. And that's what the media general letter was referring to when it said the complaint settlement procedure. It's actually a law. So apart from the constitution saying investigate, so this is a point we are making. And Article 167, the constitution says that the National Media Commission should investigate. And we are saying that the word investigate would most of the time involve you talking to the other side. Because mm -hmm. actually there are, you see, the constitution can write everything. The courts have interpreted these uh, provisions, different, different, and not specifically 167. I'm talking about provisions that look like it. So when you hear the word investigate, and when you are going to take a decision that affects the rights of another person, they call it is judicial. And that's how it comes through for organizations like NMC. So they say in that particular thing, that particular respect, that function is quasi-judicial because you are investigating and going to take a decision that affects the rights of another person. Mm -hmm. So implicit in the investigation is the right, is the duty to listen to the other side. Okay? So uh, when you see here, 167B, that I'm interested in the investigation, it says, including the investigation, mediation, and settlement of complaints made against or by the press or other mass media. So implicit in investigation is listen to the other side because when you are done, you're going to take a decision that affects somebody's rights. And so there are a long line of court decisions that say that in that case, you must listen to the other side. So to the extent that NMC has not done that, they are, their letter is a non-starter. Non-starter. So let's go back now for the avoidance of doubt. For the avoidance of doubt, it's stated in clearly in the LI, 1587. It says, let's go to, so it's the, all the procedures, lodging a complaint and then straight, because we don't have time, let's go to the regulation four. It says mm -hmm. that where a complaint lodged with the commission is referred to the settlement committee, the executive secretary of the commission shall, within seven days of the reference, mm -hmm. serve on the person against whom the complaint is made a copy of the complaint inviting the person to submit his comments or answer within seven days from the date of the service of the copy of the complaint. That's it. Sha. There you have it. So the, the emphasis is, there... is on the mandatory expression of shall. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, not, it's, not, it's not an option. Yeah. It is something that has to necessarily mm -hmm. be done, yes. that the forum must be created. Excellent. The person or stations must be heard. Excellent. Then from there, they, so when uh, this, in this case, Unia TV or Media General Response, then they will serve a copy on the other party. Then he will look at it and can also then respond. Then you go. So based upon it, and step by step, then there's formal investigations. So after they giving the notice, give your response and the rest, if the complainer doesn't give up and he says he wants the matter to go on, Formal investigation, so it says, Regulation 6, for the purpose of investigating a complaint under sub-regulation 5.2 of these regulations, the settlement committee shall serve the person against whom the complaint is made a notice specifying as far as practicable, A, the particulars and details of the allegations that form the subject matter of the investigation, and B, the date, time, place at which the investigation is to be held Blah, blah, blah. You see it? Yes. Because it says that the, uh, before they decide, uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, decide it, they will look at it. Is this a matter if proved? It's very serious. So if you haven't gone through your own LI 1587, there are other things. And most especially, let's come to this. Let's come, especially in respect of the letter that Media Commission wrote to uh, this the is the Ghana Independent Broker Association. No, the Advertisers Association. The, the Advertisers how do you write such a letter? I mean, how? Because look at it. It says that this matters when a complaint is being made against somebody. It is what it must be held confidentially. Investigations to be held in private. Uh -huh. An investigation into a complaint under these regulations shall be held in private unless it is in the interest of justice or for any sufficient cause the settlement committee that raised the hearing to be held in public, blah, blah, blah. 
So the point I'm saying is that these things are supposed to be private. How on earth do you write to advertisers saying that they are advertising at their own risk? Is that due process when the whole thing is supposed to be kept confidential? And it, it's for a, a, this is a good reason because the framers of the law know the power of media. It's not for a joke that it is called the fourth estate of the realm, right? And even uh, we've said in the past, I like this favorite quote by former U.S. president. I think Thomas Jefferson was the fourth president or so. Look, as far back as the 1820s, Jefferson saw that, listen, a strong media creates a better society than an ex executive that is corrupt. A strong media creates a better society than an executive that is corrupt. So he says that, look, he prefers a society that has media and no government to a society that has a government but no media. Can you imagine? That's Jefferson. You can Google him. What did Jefferson say about the importance of media? You see. So we don't play with it. So when you see the lawmaker saying that, hey, these investigations hold them in private, please, it's for a good purpose. Don't run down the media. After all, Article 167 says that, what? Promote and ensure the freedom and independence of the media. Go through due process. You've not gone through due process. So how do you write to the National Communication Authority? On what basis? Have you gone through, have you complied with the LI? On what basis? Can the NMC come again? Look, I mean, so I can say, I've quoted you the laws. It, it gives me, you know, so, so as soon as this happened, my mind just went straight to clearing agent. You know, President Kufado is a clearing agent, and he put Ayeboafu there. Yeah, uh, listen, uh, Ayeboafu, the chairman of the NMC. He's the president's nominee on the NMC. And this is not the first time. You remember the Manasse Azuri documentary, Militia in the City? The one, uh, the presidency, they were using, uh, listen, uh, party food soldiers to provide security at formal events. And Manasseh did an investigation on it. The presidency wasn't happy. Then they reported to the National Media Commission. When they went into it, when you Google, you see Samson Ladia of Joy FM write about it. You see that the NMC boggled it. They bungled the investigation. The committee members weren't even aware of the decision the NMC took. Committee members meet, and then a decision is taken and put somewhere. So, yeah. Joy FM made those uh, allegations, asked if NMC was able to uh, rebut those. They're saying that the decision NMC was reaching was not according to law. Because committee members meet, and then somebody else is uh, controlling the decision from uh, elsewhere, a person who is not on the committee. So it gives me the impression that Aibu Afu too has become like a clearing agent to his boss, President Kufado. The Kufado is clearing agent. Aibu Afu is also clearing agent here. Because this is the second one. I don't say it lightly. We need to be able to do this things to move our institutions forward. So, Mr. Ayabuafu, we will not take this. Please, just go back. NMC must also deal with, act within the law. NMC is not above the law. Why are you in a hurry? Then the, when you read the letter, it's referring to Rwanda and Kenya. Are we Rwanda and Kenya? Are we Rwanda? What kind of, what? Do we look like Rwanda and Kenya? What sort of hasty conclusions are Are we Rwanda and Kenya? Are we Rwanda and Kenya? When Kennedy Japan mentioned in 20, uh, what, was it 2012, that, that, that time, that Everest should be killed, blah, blah, blah. He was arrested, all those things. They did cause such a thing. We, we like due process. Don't just likely compare us to Rwanda and Kenya. We don't like that type of comparison. So, so it, there's we a don't statement like that, that just come through yesterday. Sorry? There's a statement from the National Media Commission yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I um, think in pre preparing for this conversation, I gave copies of that statement yeah. out. And I think it's, it's a public statement from the NMC mm -hmm. as well. Um, responding to the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, GIBA. And this statement was also signed by the Executive Secretary of the NMC. There's a portion of that statement, which we're going to put on the screen shortly. He says, opportunity for fair hearing. And I'm coming back because of the point you made in um, LI 1587. That ties into Article 167B about the investigation and mediation mm. function mm. of the National Media Commission. Mm -hmm. And if what you read in LI 1587 is anything to go by, mm -hmm. that the emphasis on the shall, mm -hmm. these, yeah. these in the individuals mm -hmm. or media houses yeah. shall be giving some sort of a forum or mm -hmm. a hearing. Mm -hmm. 
the NMC in the statement says, opportunity for fair hearing, quote, comes in when the criminal ignores the warning and puts himself in harm's way mm -hmm. with the law. It is at that point that the wrongdoer faced with the law is giving opportunity for fair hearing. And so we have initiated a process. We assure you that the errant stations may have their opportunity for fair hearing. They put that in inverted commas. Ah. At the right time mm. in the appropriate <laughs> forum. Mm. So what when 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 is it the right time? Is it at the beginning of all this process or it is at the behest of the of the NMC? Okay, so that's where they are getting it wrong. Listen. This then look at the law. What you look at is that the NMC must live within its own law. This is a serious matter. You're saying somebody should retract and apologize. He says it's not. So once he says it's not, you can't then say that you finished. And so you are, uh, what, uh, meting out sanctions. No. Look at the, yes, yeah, so you see there's a bit of it that they, under the law, you know, the way the law is couched, sometimes I see the point they are trying to make, that, okay, if we receive a case, we can see if, just like Article 167 talks about mediation and the rest, we'll see if we can use mediation. But if you are attempting to mediate, and the person says, I won't be mediated. They are not interested in mediate. Use the formal process. Mm -hmm. You see it? Use the formal process. Because you see, what he's trying to see, I can see the spirit of what he's trying to see here. He says this, that without prejudice, that's regulation nine. He says, without prejudice to the other provisions of these regulations, the commission may, where it, considered it considers it necessary for the discharge of its functions under the act, refer to the settlement committee for formal investigations, any mm -hmm. publication, act, or omission of any journalist, blah, blah, blah. You see it? Yes. So I see this. Is, so they are looking at it and think mm -hmm. that it's not every time that you should just go straight. Yes, you can. But where the issues are said that the person you are trying to mediate says, I won't be mediated. Now, mediation is uh, by force. Is it by force? And please, all this thing we are doing, we are not going to the substance. Yes, some, my attention has been drawn to some of the substance and the allegations and the rest. Please, I don't want to comment on that one. Let's use due process. Mm -hmm. Let's use due process. Because now you are saying, look at the substance. You see, if we look at the substance and put away the law, that's what we did. We sat down as a society and watched our military take helicopters, go into a chairman, and brutalize our citizens, cause our citizens to drink uh, this and gutter water, yeah. eh, sewage, hmm. all that. And we are quiet as a society. So if you begin to do this, that because you've spoken about the military mm -hmm. hierarchy, so because of that, you want to railroad. So you say we're not going to the substance. Yes. Case, so so that's, please, that's let this thing stop. The military are also part of uh, Ghana. They must also live under the law. We have not finished counting the damage they caused to our democracy by going to brutalize so, the people of Ashaman. Ash and now you want to do this one so, to, so, you want to set aside the law so to So since you said we are not getting into the yes. merits of the case How? and the details of it, yes. um, I, I just want to... Yes, so we are talking about due process. So please, due process. this is not the only law, okay, that deals with this. When you go to the National Labor Commission, they also have their procedures like that. When you make a complaint there, first they try to mediate. If the mediation doesn't work, then they go on to what? The uh, this one, arbitration. In actual fact, they even start with conciliation, where they tell the parties, so three stages. They try to bring the parties together. They themselves should talk and see if they can resolve. So conciliation. If conciliation fails, then the Labor Commission will try to do mediation. If mediation fails, then they go to arbitration, where you use the law strictly uh, this one, as stipulated. So, so, so that's so why I, I wanted to understand whether the determination of the right time for opportunity for fair hearing was at the behest of the NMC and at what point? So you explained that quite yeah. clearly, mm -hmm. that it's, it's the first step yeah. of the long process. Mm -hmm. If that somebody Since has been accused yeah. or, or a concern is being brought about mm -hmm. or against a particular media mm -hmm. house or an individual, mm -hmm. the first of the entire process mm -hmm. is the forum to be heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor Kobi Mensah is a lecturer it's, uh, at the University of Ghana Business School, senior lecturer. He is a political marketing strategist, but most importantly for this conversation, um, one key analyst in the media space as well. Professor Kobi Mensah is joining us on, uh, on Zoom, but we cannot show 
his video because of where his Professor Kumenza, if you can hear me, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Alfred, thank you. I can hear you. Great. Let me now, say hi to Martin. Mm -hmm. Right from the beginning of, of all of these issues, you have followed this every step of the way. Uh, what are the specific concerns you have about how things have played out in this particular case of the NMC and the UNION, TV and UNION FM? Alfred, I think that uh, Martin had actually addressed the issue extensively, especially even from the legal perspectives. I mean, having actually thought, you know, uh, political communication PR for almost 10 years, I haven't actually seen uh, processes like this before. It's almost like an individual as opposed to an organization taking decisions. And when, when you look at the statements that actually come in from the quarters, i.e. NMC, it baffles me that we have institutions behaving like this. I mean, the, in the, within the political system, I mean, our democratic you know, systems, one of the things that democracy really stands up with is the media freedom. The idea that we should, you know, at all times promote you know, uh, diversity within the media space. We should promote, you know, freedom of speech, etc. Of course, not to the detriment of what we call the public good, but you know, in a manner that promotes, you know, everybody's, you know, uh, what we call right within the framework of the democracy that we actually cherish. And this particular procedure completely, I mean, the process going and completely flouts that particular you know, uh, uh, responsibilities. And so I'm really not sure what the intentions and the, the purposes of the NMC are, really. Uh, because if we're saying that state institutions, especially, you know, NMC, must promote, you know, media freedom, this is not the way you do it. I mean, if there have been infractions, and as Martin rightly put it, there are, you know, uh, structures set out to actually do this. But you don't go about, you know, writing letters to uh, institutions that you think, you know, would make, you know, the media house stronger, and then trying to win them off a critical revenue, and you still say that you haven't even begun, you know, a disciplinary procedure or you know, a sanctioning procedure. So if you haven't begun a sanctioning procedures, why then do you go about writing to? You know, advertising in you know, an association. I, it baffles me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that point that you made uh, is captured in the latest statement from the uh, National Media Commission, which we're going to put on the screen shortly. Uh, but you agree with that position that the forum for hearing is just basic and fundamental to the natural law of justice, is it not? Absolutely. I mean, I wonder, you know, who would actually exact a certain, you know, sanction without hearing parties, you know, uh, position. And this, they have flouted. Obviously, if you had informed a certain, you know, uh, stakeholder, that ensures the going concern of the media house or ensures this, uh, the sustainability of the media house, you have already exacted sanction. So I don't even understand the point that they make that, you know, they haven't actually, you know, uh, issued a sanction. Part of a sanction is that you are really uh, preventing or you are curtailing the freedom of someone. You are curtailing their natural order. Now, you had written to Advertising Association of Ghana not to do business with the, uh, what you call the media house, which mm -hmm. is the crucial part of their sustainability. You have already started exacting sanctions. So for you to say that you haven't actually exact, uh, exacted sanctions until you give them fair hearing, which you haven't even constituted, then I'm not sure what, what their positions are. It's very, very contradictory what they're actually saying. It doesn't make sense. So that, that notice to the Adversary Association of Ghana constitutes a sanction, you'll say. And of so the, the details of, of it that they haven't even started sanctioning yet is inconsistent with that particular directive to the Association of it's, it's very the Advertising Association. And I'm sure Martin is in a better position to explain from a legal perspective yeah. what you mean by curtailing somebody's freedom. Yeah. If the natural you know, order or the natural uh, uh, what do you call activities of the media house 
is including, you know, advertising revenue that ensures their sustainability. And you are asking such a crucial stakeholder to stay off, haven't you exacted the sanctions already? So I'm not sure what they say. I mean, even by normal language, I mean, English language, if you follow what you've done and to say that you haven't actually started sanctioning, yet you are preventing or you are actually asking a crucial stakeholder not to fund, you know, so to speak, an advertising, uh, what do you call it, a media house. You have begun the processes already. So I'm not sure what they mean by we haven't started, you know, uh, until a fair hearing is given. And to be honest with you, the language that I find this uh, in the letter is very, very colloquial. I'm surprised that an institution like NMC could issue a letter like this. And if the board or whatever had actually seen it, I'm surprised that they allowed this letter to go because it's nowhere near any formality. It doesn't at all. It's like an individual, uh, maybe my NSS student writing a letter and sending this letter to me for preview. And then perhaps I can ask them to change it because there is nothing about this letter that shows that it's official. Because the use of some kind of, uh, 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 what do you call it? Like the criminal, a criminal, you know, uh, you are alerting a criminal not to proceed their criminality. Yeah. You are warning some, I mean, how do you, I, I couldn't believe that an official letter could, could be written like this. It's completely off, absolutely colloquial. And it made it, I mean, the authorities really saw this letter to come out. I haven't seen a PR like this before for all the 10 years that I've been teaching uh, this uh, political communication, technical report writing. I have never seen an official letter that is so you know, absolutely porous like this written to the public. It is, it is very sad. Now, that, that letter that you make reference to uh, consistently, the latest letter from the National Media Commission on this matter was released yesterday. Take a look at this. Um, yesterday, the holiday, that's when this statement came. That's the response to GIBA, the GIBA press statement by the NMC. So the NMC says, we write with reference to your press statement. That's GIBA's press statement issued on Thursday, November 30, 2023, regarding the Commission's intervention to grant ONIA TV and ONIA FM their wish to exit the broadcasting market by unprofessional practice. Our notice of suspension stands to the extent that the stations invited this upon themselves. Please note that your press statement is of no consequence to the process. We wrote to you out of courtesy. So they actually wrote to the Ghana Independent Broadcast Association as well, not just the Advertiser Association alone or the NCA. So they said they wrote to Giba out of courtesy. So if it is Giba's wish that they do not grant Giba that courtesy in future, they will respect that. It goes on. Regarding how we deal with other organizations, including the Advertising Association of Ghana, the ordinary rules of etiquette would require you not to attempt to dictate to us. Goes on. We also wish to provide you information that the claim in your press statement that the commission acted without giving the opportunity for fair hearing to the stations rather than pronouncing sanctions upon them has no foundation. It goes on. NMC has not issued any sanctions on the two offending stations yet. And that's what Professor Kobmensa, you, you, you disagree. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the details yeah. of it as well, pro, pro, um, lawyer Matic people as well. Mm -hmm. What we have done is to file a notice of suspension. We did that after issuing them warnings to desist. Can you go back? Let's go back. Go back. It, it says, what we have done is to file a notice of suspension. We did that after issuing them warnings to desist from their professional delinquency. Neither the cease and desist orders nor the notice of suspension constitutes sanctions. It goes on and says, a cease and desist order only warns a criminal, wrongdoer, or a delinquent professional to stop their misbehavior and to withdraw from their lawlessness. 
uh, it does not constitute sanctions. It is akin to asking a pickpocket to stop stealing or to stop a person poisoning the public well to stop his murderous act. It does not involve any hearing. Opportunity for fair hearing comes in when the criminal ignores the warning and puts himself in harm's way with the law. It is at that point that the wrongdoer faced with the law is giving opportunity for fair hearing. We have initiated a process. We assure you that the Iran stations may have their opportunity may. And I must be able, the, the word there says, according to the NMC statement, says we assure you that these stations may have, may mm -hmm. have their opportunity for fair hearing at the right time. Not well. In, okay. in the, mm -hmm. and, but you read, you read yeah. the LI15887, which says that mm -hmm. it, it, it's a shall. Yes. It's, it's so, mandatory. It, yes. Read that provision yes. again. You can't <laughs> this. Uh, For me, well, please. It says, so lodging regulation 3 1 is when a person is lodged a complaint, right? Then we go to uh, Regulation 4, Procedure for Dealing with Complaint. Okay? It says, 4 1, a complaint lodged with the Commission shall be referred to the Settlement Committee as soon as practicable after receipt by the Commission. Then, 2, where a complaint lodged with the Commission is referred to the Settlement Committee, the Executive Secretary of the Commission shall within seven days of the reference, serve on the person against whom the complaint is made, a copy of the complaint inviting the person to submit his comments or answer within seven days from the date of the service of the copy of the complaint. So seven days, that's very, very short actually, but you see, it says seven days. So they themselves, once the complaint is being referred to the committee, then within seven days. So you can't keep the complaint at the secretariat, okay? You can't keep it at the secretariat for that long. Once your, the parties, or let's say one of the parties says it's not interested in mediation. Yes. Meanwhile, my understanding even is that uh, FM and, uh, this Onuya TV have written to NMC a number of times without any response. You see? So if, so let's just take it. Uh, well, you know, he says, she says. Bottom line is that it's clear. One thing that we all cannot dispute in this case is that the mediation didn't work because you ask the person, apologize and retract, and the person says, I won't. So it means that the mediation is not working. So go through the formal process. Mm -hmm. Go through it. But you can't. That letter to the uh, NCA, oh, it's taking our democracy back several steps. Yeah, it's like we made so, two steps forward. Mr. Okan said one sentence mm -hmm. on it, and then five steps back especially in the context of the fact that this year we fell, what, two steps again from 60th position last year, 2022, mm -hmm. the World Press Freedom mm -hmm. Index. This year we fell again to what, 62nd. Then go forward, 2018 where we did, uh, we got the best in recent times under President Kufuadu. That's when we, we placed 23rd. And that's when we ha had the world event in Ghana. President Kufuadu said what? He prefers boisterous and scurrilous nonsense, okay, to the ones that we just do yes sir, yes sir, at the monotonous media. So there is that uh, slack that as long as we're human beings and we're doing this work, there'll be mistakes. Don't forget the politicians are tough skinned. They are not gentlemen. If they were gentlemen, just, just like Ghana you. would not be like this. <laughs> just like you. Professor Entry, yes. yes. Uh, we uh, were showing some videos of the Onuya Power Walk for okay. uh, Press Freedom, which has been on the screen a few times. Yes. I, I think that uh, we are behaving like the singing band, where they take three steps mm -hmm. forward and then two steps back, and mm -hmm. then they don't move forward. Mm -hmm. This is a bullying letter to gag mm -hmm. Onuya, you know, TV and Onuya FM. Mm -hmm. We have press freedom. And we know that the media is the fourth realm of the government. They are supposed to, you know, educate, entertain, and then inform us about everything that is going on. Without the media, we are doomed. Mm -hmm. Now, we can see, if you do a simple deductive and inductive analysis, this is clearly political, mm -hmm. very political. Mm -hmm. And it's the National Media Commission Executive Secretary who is being pushed from the presidency to write this letter so that Omiya will be gagged. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is simple deductive and deductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. Why we don't want to tell the truth? You see, Ghanaians are mad people who tell the truth, but they don't want to speak the truth. My mother will wake up every morning listening to Captain Smart on Omiya, and I've been asking her why. She said, he tells the truth. 
The truth is what Ghanaians are looking for. And what, what did the media, if, if you use the word investigate and then mediate, investigation is carrying out systematic and formal inquiry to discover an allegation. So what has been systematic about what the National Media Commission have done? What has been formal about what they've done? This is just a warning, you know, that they have not even given them the chance to respond. Look at it. Somebody come to complain. And I listened to this woman uh, talking about Nana Yajentua. She was talking about if there's a complaint at the National Com uh, Media Commission, where are the tapes? Who was he insulting? So a lot of issues have been raised. You have not given me the chance to even respond to that. And there are two sides of a story. Somebody complains. Somebody says that what I did, there was no insult. You know, I spoke to the fact. In fact, the, the truth hurts. The truth, we should be told that it hurts. When people are being told the truth, they think that you are attacking their personality. But we should not take anything personally when it comes to issues that we are discussing because we can only speak to the facts. And the fact is that they are doing their job. They have the press or the media freedom unless it borders on ethics. You know, because every media person is warned about the ethics of the media, you know. And if they have not crossed the boundary of ethics, if they've not wrong anything, you go by the procedure, you know, that this is the issue you want to mediate. Mediate what? I said I did not insult anybody. I, I was in the media space. And I'm a dean not only of business, but communication as, as well, academic city. When you talk about issues like this, very, very and important. you want people to mediate, if I have done the wrong thing, I remember one time, I was interviewing a former president, I won't mention the name, when I was in the media, and then they came with questions that I should ask, you know, these are the questions. And I said that if you have your question, then you don't need me. And they said, what kind of guy is that? I said, well, if you have your own questions, then you don't need me here, mm -hmm. you know, as a host. And they said, but we want you to be careful the way you ask the question. I said, my questions will be fair. And I ask fair, bold questions because I'm always thinking about the way my mother at home will understand my questions. Mm -hmm. That's how I do my things. But this issue, let's break it to the barest minimum. You are investigating an issue. If you want to investigate, somebody has made a complaint. Now you go to the person and say that the way you talk, the way you insult, bring tapes, bring videos. And the person is saying that I'm speaking to the facts. These are my facts. You go through the legal process. Unfortunately, we are using the same legal process. You know, we, we to haven't even gotten to that our point. Our own system. I think like, at least based on the mm. f details as has been mm -hmm. provided, there hasn't even been that process of a mm -hmm. forum mm -hmm. that you are even talking about for the hearing of whether or yeah. not there is. So if they have not the reached there, then you mm. can't write this letter. So, yes. So, so what I'm saying to mm. conclude this is that. Mm. The uh, Onia TV and Onia FM were right in their response that this letter is wrongfully mm. directed. And uh, Professor Kovimensa, and, and uh, I'm going to round yeah. up with you on this matter um, uh, as well, especially the point that uh, Professor um, Enoch Enchi made about how uh, this, especially that detail, the detail of that letter that we put out there, that if you look at the understanding of the NMC's own point of the opportunity for fair hearing they say their definition of at the right time and in the appropriate forum is not at the beginning of the process as the law requires as has been detailed by lawyer martin people what do you expect going forward i mean for me i i think that um as has been pointed out it looks like someone somewhere is trying to pull uh, this trigger uh, for a purpose not necessarily you know to to uh, sort of a complete a procedure but it looks like that they they want to as some people would say shake the system small uh, for me it is about you know tarnishing the brand it is about you know uh, kind of um, uh, preventing the brand to be uh, to be in good business, uh, so that obviously it would affect the strength of the brand in terms of sustainability, and so I suspect that along the line the process will curtail, but once it curtails, they have actually achieved their their aim of weakening you know that brand. I suspect that's that's what is happening because, I mean, it doesn't make sense if you look at the. Uh, paragraph eight of the letter that they sent to Giba. 
you said that you haven't actually started sanctions, but you have already, you know, pronounced, you know, criminality on the media, uh, media house. You have likened the media house to a pickpocket. When you haven't even started the formal processes of investigating, you haven't had a, a fair hearing, etc. So it, it shows some somewhere just want to use a certain mischievous means to draw up what they want, i.e. reduce the potency of the media house and along the line curtail the process. And if that happens, I hope you know, the media house will take the proper and appropriate legal redress uh, for the harm caused, because certainly this is not a right procedure. And I don't see it going forward, uh, them you know, completing the process. I suspect that they will curtail it along the way. You suspect that it's going to be curtailed along the way? If not, what, what would you call this? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it, they, they have started wrongly. Uh, along the line, nothing seems to be appropriate. As you know, uh, Martin actually read the, 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 uh, the legal document to you. I mean, their own processes. You know, it, it doesn't see, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem that they are working within those framework. And if that is the case, it means that somewhere there's an informality to the entire process just to achieve a certain aim, a certain end. And that's why my suspicion is that they will curtail it. Professor Kobe Mensah, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Keep On On This Matter. I'm going to round up with you on this, especially mm -hmm. because of uh, the position of the law, because mm -hmm. everything that's happening, regardless of um, the the details as you made reference to mm -hmm. has to happen within the remit of the law mm -hmm. not? and you refer to two specific laws article 167b and then also the li 1587 mm -hmm. so it is indeed the case that it is this opportunity to be heard or opportunity for a fair hearing mm -hmm. is is an integral part of yes. the natural law of justice that's it yeah natural law so lawyers call it popularly or the alteran pattern Yes, this is a serious matter. To every law, of course, there are exceptions, but obviously, this is not a case of the exception. So, we'll not waste, uh, we'll not, we can't afford to explain the exception here, mm -hmm. but it's accepted that every law has an exception. This one, you are attacking the license. That is the heartbeat of the business. Yeah, heartbeat, and you think this one, you can do such a thing. You see? Exactly. You see how Professor Men, uh, this uh, compliments have put it? You're attacking the brand. Talking about their brand, this is like a uh, part of the fight for election 2024. That's what I see. Yes. So part that, of the fight for election 2024. This guy cut him to size. Once you cut him to size, then, I mean, come on, come on. We can't do this. That, so this can, letter. So that, that writing, to, that, that, that letter to the, yeah. the, the Advertising Association of Ghana yeah. in the remit of the law constitutes mm. a sanction. That's contrary to what the... Yeah, MMC absolutely. This is a real sanction. It's cutting oxygen from the business. This is just to ruin the business. That's Every to business ruin business thrives you on, on adverts. Exactly. And if you tell them the yeah. advertisers not to advertise with them, hey. how do they pay their workers? Oh, that is bad. It's, it's terrible. Alfred, how do they this, pay their this workers? Terrible. This is going to affect our press, uh, this uh, freedom index. It's going to affect it. We will perform see, ways again but, but, from but lawyer, seconds. Why should we wait for mm -hmm. outsiders to, you know, freedom mm -hmm. index and everything for yeah. them to rate us? Yeah. We should rate ourselves. Yeah. yeah, that's what we are doing now. So we what are rating kind of ourselves. Are we like, we see, the, the white people are not smarter than us. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have okay. been teaching them. Mm -hmm. They are mm. not smarter, but they go by the rules and the regulations. Mm. They are fair, yeah. you know, they have values, mm. but we don't. Yeah. If, you want, if you are an institution and you want to, you know, just be, you know, loyal to the appointing authority, uh -huh. then you have a problem. Mm. That is our biggest issue. Mm. So your job is more important to you than yeah. the nation. Yeah. Yes. 30 minutes it. to the top of the hour. Yes. And we remain your election command center. We've been showing videos of the Onia TV, Onia FM power work for press freedom. And this, that's what uh, was showing on the screen not too long ago. Yeah, there you have it. Mm -hmm. um, it was yesterday. And also a number of you who have been sending messages um, on Facebook, we're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook on this matter as well. Uh, thank you very much. Now, we're going to touch base with our, a number of our correspondents who have been standing by for quite a while now. I, apologies. And this is your election command center. Uh, we're crossing over now. Take a look.
Yes, uh, this is your election command center. And uh, briefly, uh, to give you an idea of uh, the specific numbers and what is happening now. And we understand that voting has started in some constituencies. There's been some uh, misunderstanding at Okaikwe North constituency. Some delegates supporting the Honorable Fuseni Issa, the former minister for that constituency. They are accusing Ifia Koto, who is also contesting uh, for, to represent the MPP in that constituency for bringing delegates unknown to the constituency to the polling grounds to vote. Uh, my colleague Judith Brown is in the Okaikwe North constituency where this is happening. Judith, what's the Morning. latest on this matter? I am in the Okaikwe North constituency where there are about uh, six candidates vying for the seat here. We have Honorable Kusena. Uh, Kuseni Gisa, we have Ifia Akoto, we have Nana Amakdokia, we also have Kofia de Kanyabu, and we have uh, Prince Ousumensa and lawyer Ken Crunch. And these six candidates are vying for the seat here in the Okakwe North Constituency. We also know that the delegates here are 850 in number. This is a swing constituency, and so we know that in uh, 2020, uh, the seat was taken over by the NDP, and that was in the person of Theresa Wuni. She won by a little uh, close to 2,000 votes, and so uh, she won against uh, Honorable Hussein Isa then. And so, of course, he is uh, saying that he is he, he would want to take this seat back, and so. He's hoping to win this particular election. Uh, moments ago, we saw that there was a bit of confusion here at the polling center where some uh, delegates that are in support of Hussein Issa were saying that a number of uh, delegates have been brought here. They do not belong to this constituency and they're here to vote for Ifia Akoto. That was the allegation they were making currently here at the uh, Kaikwe North constituency. And so there was a bit of confusion, but I spoke to some of the delegates and this is what uh, they have been saying. Going on there. Um, we are just um, some two hours into voting. Um, as usual, some of the in fact, most of the delegates will want to see the aspirants and for some last minute pep talk before they come to vote. But I understand already we are hitting about 150 people within the first two hours. And given that a whole electoral college is about 846, in fact, the people who vote is about 830 because there are some people who are dead, some traveled and all of them, about 830. Given, given where we are two hours into the polls, I think it's, it's all right. Um, I think the place is well secured. I think the police presence here is, is, is good enough. And um, I, I, I pray and hope that it's going to continue like this until 2 p.m. when the declaration is We are seeing some misunderstandings. I'm sure that you've been briefed about what exactly the issue is, if you can tell us what it is. I just got here a moment ago, but apparently there are people who are not known to this constituency who actually want to force their way into the voting center. So that's what is creating the, the, the sort of misunderstanding there. But the procedures are that for anybody to get access here, you have to be accredited. Like I have in my, in my, my, my neck, there are accreditation cards made for those who qualify to get in. So once you don't have one, you have no business here. But this is where Okanko okay, North is got into, and the people are singing out there. We are very much aware of things and the dynamics within those elections, and so people are a little charged up. But I hope that over time, we just go down and then we'll do the right thing. Six of you contesting. Um, what will you, you say at your last word to delegate? Um, are you hopeful of a victory by the close of this exercise? It is the fourth time I'm taking part in this contest. I did in 2012, 2015, 2020, and now in 2023. If there's an experienced politician in Okakwino, about Okakwino, with Okakwino, for Okakwino, to say any stands out. Then again, when I got an opportunity as a member of parliament, the people will tell you, my work, what I had to do for the constituency as a member of parliament, what I had to do for the party as a member of parliament, were perfect and they are very, very much appreciative of what we did. 
within the four years. Unfortunately, in 2020, the party's peculiar situation did not allow us to be united like we needed to going into the general elections. And that caused our defeat. I, have, I was a leader then. I keep telling the people, I have learned lessons and we are building on those lessons from the last election. So I'm urging everybody to unite behind me so we can go back to our seat and be able to break the eight. That's what's happening in the Okaikwe North constituency. And I'll round up with you, uh, Judith. So I was talking about the security situation there in the midst of this misunderstanding. I see a number of the police personnel behind you. Tell me about the security situation there. So there's heavy security presence currently at the Okaikwe North constituency. Of course, the police are doing everything they can to calm the situation. Currently, the situation has been calmed down. Uh, initially, a number of um, delegates were fighting with the policemen, but of course, they were able to calm the situation down because there are quite a number of policemen here. And so, yes, they are doing their job and uh, tensions have been calmed here in the constituency or at the polling center. We are hoping that, uh, I mean, voting is currently ongoing still. So we are hoping that moving on nothing more would happen to sort of mark the electoral process. Judith Brown, thank you very much uh, for this update uh, of the NPP's often constituency uh, elections taking place today. And uh, Judith brought us the updates from the Okaikwe North constituency. We understand some delegates uh, supporting the former member of parliament for the area, Fuseni Issa, accusing a fiaco to one of the other contestants uh, of bringing delegates unknown to the constituency to the polling station that is what led to that confusion that which has been which has been settled also the total number of the orphan constituencies of the NPP is 138 the orphan constituencies are the constituencies that the NPP doesn't have or represent in parliament that's the 137 NDC held seats in parliament plus formina which is the independent candidates constituency was a member of the MPP until the 2020 elections and matters are rising. He's the second deputy speaker of parliament. So it is this 138 that they call the orphan constituencies. But a number of constituencies have been exempted from their voting today and tomorrow. That's uh, six of them because the party says they are engaging in some consultations to ensure that they address all the issues in those six constituencies. So the number of constituencies up for election during this often constituencies primaries is 111, 111. And 20 of the 138, that's the constituencies that the NPP is seeking to also wrestle from the NDC is also going by popular acclamation. So that's why you have just 111 of the constituencies um, up for election for today. So those numbers are going to be on the screen right now. My colleague Komla Kluche is also joining us now. Komla, thank you so much for connecting with us. Where exactly are you and uh, what is happening where you are, Komla? So, Alfred, I am at... Uh the Ablekuma South constituency, uh, and specifically, this is the location for the Ablekuma South constituency, the Kolebu uh, police station. Voting started at, at exactly 7.04 this morning. Largely, it's been a peaceful uh, deal. No, no issue whatsoever has gone on here. I mean, if you look at it just, just, just from the the side of the voting. Let me just take you through. You can just look behind. You can see the crowd there. The police station has been divided into two. This is a police station that has 1,010 people who are voting. So they've divided it into two. Uh, this is the first unit. And the other unit is at the other side. So the people are able to go through the process without any hitch. They intend to do this and then they close by 2 p.m. Uh, there isn't any issue because this is a police station. Uh, it does appear that there is actually law and order over here. There is absolutely no issue whatsoever here. Now, the people who uh, are contesting this uh, particular election, they they are two. We have uh, these are 
their names. Uh, we can just run by you very shortly. Uh, they are Rita, just, just a few seconds to be able to just pull out the names on the number of people mm -hmm. who are voting. There are two actually. So we have um, Rita, Rita Adole, and then Joseph, uh, who are contesting this election. Okay, so specifically, these are the names. So someone Agwe Latte, and then Rita Akwele Ad Adote, they are contesting this election. I haven't seen the candidates here so far this morning. But like you can see, if you see from the shots over there, Alfred, you can see the police doing the scanning of the people who uh, are entering, the delegates who are entering. Alfred, it's quite a very secure area because it's a police station. And so no foreign material is actually allowed in. No metallic substance is allowed in. So the people are actually screened by the state security agencies here in the police so that no issue of the weapon whatsoever comes into the yard. It does appear that because it is a police station, everything is going in an orderly manner. But as we speak now, we understand that uh, almost about uh, five, 500 people there about have been able to cast their votes in this constituency, which is the Ablekuma South constituency. This is the constituency that has the former mayor of Accra, Alfred uh, Okovanapoy, being the member of uh, parliament. And one person must represent the MPP to be able to snatch the seat from the former mayor of Accra. I see, and I, I see the crowd mounting up uh, behind you. Uh, there. You talk about security as well, Komala. And uh, did voting start at the scheduled time? Absolutely. It started just uh, four minutes after seven. In fact, by the time I got here, just uh, about five minutes or 6.55. By the time I got here, the EC officials were here. They had done the uh, 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 work. Uh, the boots were ready. Everything was set. And just seven, uh, four minutes after seven, the electoral officials had called them to come into the queue and they are going through uh, the process. There is absolutely no issue here whatsoever. We haven't had any complaints or anything so far as of yet. Okay, Kamala, thank you so much. Kamala Kluch is my colleague there uh, on the ground for us here on your election command centre. We're going to cross over now uh, to other parts of the country, the Ashanti region uh, as well. We're also getting information in Evalua, uh, Jomoro, Jura constituency where uh, elections have been cancelled over confusion about the venue for this election so we would would go go over there shortly information we're gathering also indicate that uh while some of the delegates are insisting that the venue for the election should be in the constituency capital of axim the regional executives are also saying it should be held in the jura area this has created some confusion which led to the cancellation of the election in that particular constituency and let's go straight to uh, my colleague William Evans Incom in the Ejura Sechodumasi constituency, and he's joining us. And William, we understand that there's heavy security uh, where you are. Tell us what's been happening in the Ejura Sechodumasi constituency. Well, absolutely. So we are talking about 890 delegates were supposed to vote and elect among the three aspirants who has the world without to lead the party into the 2024 parliamentary election. So that's how, I mean, it, it is looking like. I mean, there is a queue, but even before you go through the voting process, you have to be subjected to some level of body check because uh, the police have scanning device that they use to check each and, I mean, uh, our, I mean any delegate who I mean, is, is, is preparing to go through the electoral process. And when you, you are done with the check-in or when they are done with the check-in, your mobile phone is also seized. I mean, I mean literally, uh, the, the, the police will take your mobile phone away from you, and that is to prevent you filming 
whilst voting uh, when you get to the toll booth. So uh, that is how, I mean, or, I mean, the voting booth. So that is how the process is looking like. But I can tell you that, uh, Alfred, it has been generally smooth. I mean, there hasn't been any uh, recorded uh, bizarre incident as far as Adra is concerned. If they come in here, we all, all had um, that mentality that because of the enhanced nature of the environment, we're going to record some level of, I mean, uh, disturbances, or if you like, tension. But I mean, it has been otherwise. And I can tell you that the police is on the ground to ensuring that the whole process goes through, pro, I mean, smoothly. So, uh, Alfred, that is it from the uh, Adra constituency. It has been generally smooth. I see. And uh, we, we understand that uh, the likes of the former constituency secretary, uh, Mohamed Amin Yakubo and likes are, are, are contesting. Give us the names of the, the people who are contesting for this constituency. All right. So we have Gifty Doa, the former constituency secretary, uh, who I understand is very solid on the ground as far as this particular process is concerned. And of course, we also have Mohamed Amin Yakubu, a man who is also well known at the grassroots level. Then Kinsley uh, Nanowusu. Kinsley Nanowusu, I'm told that he's also a philanthropist. I mean, somebody who's also been giving so much to the party. Uh, it, 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 it looks like, it looks like, I mean, from the little that I'm gathering from it, from here, uh, Gifty Indoa uh, uh, leads uh, in terms of popular vote. And one thing that is playing out for her is the fact that uh, the tribe, uh, her tribe dominates as far as Adra is concerned. And that is tilting to her advantage so that is what we know but i'm also gathering i mean gathering from the ground that if gifty wins then he she is likely to give the national democratic congress candidate Braima a competition guess what afraid since the creation of this particular constituency in 1992 the last time the mpp won this particular constituency seat was in 2012 in the shape of Sally Subamba, the former MCE whose um, appointment was revoked after the Adra crisis or, I mean, clashes. Mohammed won in 2012, but lost to Braima again. So in 1992, uh, uh, Peter Boachi Ansan was the member of parliament on the ticket of the NDC. He repeated or retained his seat in 1996 in 2000, Samson Atakra, also on the ticket of the NDC, took over from him. But in 2004, Isifu Pangamu, um, the member of parliament for uh, a drug constituency on the ticket of the NDC, of course, yeah, I mean, he's been the long serving uh, NDC uh, MP as far as uh, a drug such a Dumase is concerned. 2004, 2008, 2012, when Salisu uh, Bamba won the seat, and of course, 2016 it has to go back to the NDC in the shape of Braima, who has held the seat from that time till date. So the big question is, will the NPP be able to present a formidable force to unseat, I mean, Braima, and then win the seat for the second time? What well, I think is just a matter of time, but it's one constituency that has been very loyal to the NDC as far as the Ashanti region is concerned, Alfred. So we are, we are having four constituencies in, in, in total uh, where this uh, so, election will be taking place in the Ashanti region for the orphan constituencies. All right, so, so practically we are having three constituencies because New Adubiase was a, a popular acclamation. Okay. And that was uh, George Odro. George Odro was the former member of parliament. Uh, in 2016, he won the seat for the NPP for the first time. And in 2020, well, of course, I mean, it was taken over again by the NDC, who has had some commanding force as far as that political enclave is concerned. Uh, George Drew is coming back again, the former Deputy Minister for Agri is coming back again. Uh, it was a total support for him. So uh, his constituency is done. And of course, they know that George Drew will be representing the MPP going to the 2024 parliamentary election. So currently, we have Edras Echedumase, Asanwase constituency, and such a Afram Plains constituency, popularly known as Drogonso. William Evans Sinkum, thank you very much. And the Asuasi constituency you just mentioned is going to be our next stop. Uh, Ibrahim Abubakar, my colleague, is in the Asuasi constituency where there's a keen contest um, to wrestle the Asuasi constituency for the N N NPP. And these are visuals from the Asuasi constituency earlier today. So that's what's happening. And um, we have a presidential staffer. 
and then also to other persons who are contesting there as well as to, to represent the MPP there. And my colleague Ibrahim Abubakar is joining us on Zoom. Ibrahim, we're seeing the, the videos of uh, what's been happening since 7 a.m. in the Aswasi constituency. Tell us a bit more about the atmosphere there, the people who have showed up, and especially the security situation there. Hello, Ibrahim, can you hear me? Yes, I feel I can hear you. Great. I was asking about, we're seeing videos of what's going on there. Tell us a bit more about the security situation and how voting has transpired since 7 a.m. What press so far? So good. Um, I can say the turnout has been massive. Um, for now, voting started exactly at 7 a.m. And so far, um, I'm sure close to 300 have already voted because on my last count, That is some and um, 20 ministers. Here they are expecting 1047. This is in, um, excluding those who have traveled and, and those who have died. So today they are expecting 1047 to vote. And we all know as well, I say, uh, anytime there is an election, whether for the MPP or NDC, security is always massive. And um, because the little confrontation can degenerate into something else. So, Security situation is a very, very huge year. A number of police personnel, and um, hundreds of them have been stationed here just to ensure that everything um, starts and ends very smoothly. The police commander himself has been here together with some of his men. This is the arena where the voting uh, is taking place. But even beyond it, we have security personnel stationed at various joints just to make sure that um, they will prevent and people from coming here to cause any disturbance. Not all of them are in uniform. Some are in plain clothes, but just to take some intelligence and, and prevent anything from happening. But like I said, so far, so good. The stakes are very high here. All the three um, candidates are currently at this place. Everybody still trying to engage delegates, even though um, there have been a series of announcements that Voting has ended. Uh, this is just the only place to come and vote, and, they, and there wouldn't be any campaigning here. Yet, uh, you see the candidates coming and people following them and making noise. But so far, um, it's been generally smooth. All the three candidates, like I said, have come here and they've exchanged presently. So you could feel that uh, mutual unity among them this time around. As so as has been known, um, for disturbance, chaos, any time there is election. And even within the NPP, there has been deep deep cracks within the party. And that, they are saying that that has been the more reason why, since the creation of the constituency in 2014, they, they've not been able to win the seat from the NDC. But this time around, uh, you can see the commitment in all of them because we have set like five camps of factions here, but this time around, all of them are saying, whoever emerges victorious at the end of the day, they will all have to come together, unite, and fight for victory in the 2024 elections. Thank you so much, Ibrahim Abubakar, there in the Aswasi constituency. Really appreciate it. And uh, the situation in the Evalue Jomoro Jura constituency, where I earlier in told you elections have been cancelled over the confusion of the venue where this election is supposed to take place. So information that we are gathering indicates that while some of the delegates are insisting that the venue for the election should be in the constituency capital of Axim, others are also pushing otherwise. Um, William Peters is my colleague in the constituency. He's joining us. Uh, William, thank you so much for, for joining us. So uh, the decision staking no turning back this election in the constituency has been cancelled yeah Alfred. the elections at a value at your has been cancelled now we, we see a number of the uh, delegates complaining about this particular decision what have they been telling you yeah it's all boiled down to the confusion over the venue just as you've explained to our viewers earlier on uh, the party proposed that the election should be held 
at Bemi Anko. You know, the constituency is in Value at your Jira. What the party proposed was that it's like almost all elections are, uh, have been, uh, they have been held, holding it at Axim, which is the district capital. Though the uh, constituency itself is in Value at your Jira. So the uh, party's analysis, they decided to, this time around, uh, ensure that the election takes place at the other side of the constituency, which is uh, I value at your and uh, at the Nianko, that is the community that the area on proposed. And some party members are also saying that if you consider the Nianko, there is only one entry to the community, and they think that uh, it's a threat to them in case of an emergency. So some propose that. Uh, they should continue uh, to hold the election as has been. So DICEC and the party met. And DICEC also proposed that they considered what the uh, delegates have brought up for, uh, regarding the security issues they are raising. So they were proposing the elections should take place at Nkofo um, Agricultural Secondary School. And the party is saying that Nkofo is not under Ivalue at Jomorajira. Nkofo is under Elembele. So they can't bypass the constituency and go and hold uh, such a crucial election in another constituency. So this morning, the delegates were divided. We are talking about 639 delegates. They were divided. Some were back to Bermi and Kor, where the party uh, have been proposed, and some were also back to Azim, where others are considering uh, there, that they think that place is more safer than Bermi and Kor. So they want the election to take place at Azim. So upon careful deliberation by Musa, that is the Minister of Security Council, uh, they have decided that the election shouldn't take place because they are envisaging that should the election take place, there will be a serious security issue here that uh, evaluate at the Mordra. So that has led to the cancellation of the election. Afraid. William Peters, thank you so much for uh, this update. So there you have it on the screen. The election in that constituency, uh, Evaluate Jura Jurong, has been uh, cancelled. So that's uh, confirmed now. Just to round this up here on your election command center, we're continuing the coverage right after this. And we're going to take a quick break. When we're back, we continue the coverage. But just take a look at this. These are the, um, the contenders, the major contenders. We have a number of government officials, presidential staffers, and then also ministers, and in fact, deputy ministers who are contesting a number of the constituencies um, that the election will be taking place in this often constituencies of the new patriotic party. Yuji uh, uh your very good friend, Ramat Bebo, Wutu Senya East, um, Director of Communications at the Presidency, mm -hmm. and then also Kojo Frimpong oh, okay. Wenchi, uh, uh, Head of Corporate Affairs and External Relations, okay. MIF. Okay. And then also <laughs> Harriet Chermanteng Opong, Nkranza South, Secretary to the Chief of Staff at Jubilee House. Uh, Marco Kriko Vante, Deputy Tourism Minister, uh, Yensuano Constituency. Neil Ante Banaman, Odududu former National Coordinator of the National Premier Secretariat. You know Neil Ante Banapo is not contesting again. Uh, so, yeah. Um, Joshua Makubo, the, the OT Regional Minister, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, so, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, and, and, and a number of them, mm. indeed. Uh, you have Joseph Nidiok Penka, a very mm -hmm. good yeah, friend. Colleague, yeah. uh, he's, he's, that's why he's, you've not seen him on Key Point for a while now. Catherine Afeko, uh, in, in that, that constituency where the election has been cancelled, that's Catherine Afeko's constituency where it's taking place, Barbara Oting, Jesse and a few others as well. So thank you so much. And um, the, the, we stayed the steam on this um, NPP offer constituency primaries because my colleague Bella Mundi is going to be taking over right after this and continue the conversation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Really appreciate this. Thank you, Professor Enoch Enchi. He is the Dean of Business and also Communication Studies at the Academic City University. Thank you so much, uh, lawyer Martin Pebo. Thank you for coming. He's a private legal practitioner. He's also the convener for the Kumpregu Leader Demonstration. We have Professor Kobi Mensah also joining us. Sami Dakon, lawyer Sami Dakon of the Special Prosecutor's Office. And then also uh, we had lawyer Sevia Kuji, who is the 
head of public affairs of the Ghana Bar Association, also joining us. Thank you, gentlemen, for making the time to be here. And in fact, these conversations don't end here. We continue in, and here on your election command center, we continue the coverage of the NPP of Unconsciousness primaries right after this quick break. Stay with us.